9. Winter. Alex parted with Dawes, near the Divinity School, at a sad horseshoe-shaped apartment building in the grad school ghetto. Dawes hadn't wanted to leave the car in Alex's care, but she had papers to grade that were already late, so Alex said she would return the Mercedes to Darlington's home. She could tell Dawes wanted to refuse, papers be damned. Be careful and don't. You shouldn't, but Dawes just trailed off, and Alex had the startling realization that Dawes had to defer to her in this situation. Dante served Virgil, but Oculus served them both. And they all served Lethe. Dawes nodded, kept nodding, nodded all the way out of the car and up the walkway to her apartment, as if she was affirming every step. Darlington's house was out in Westville, just a few miles from campus. This was the Connecticut Alex had dreamed of, farmhouses without farms, sturdy red-brick colonials with black doors and tidy white trim, a neighborhood full of wood-burning fireplaces, gently tended lawns, windows glowing golden in the night like passageways to a better life, kitchens where something good bubbled on the stove, breakfast tables scattered with crayons. No one drew their curtains, light and heat and good fortune spilled out into the dark as if these foolish people didn't know what such bounty might attract, as if they'd left these shining doorways open for any hungry girl to walk through. Alex hadn't driven much since she'd left Los Angeles and it felt good to be back in a car, even when she was terrified of leaving a scratch on. Despite the map on her phone, she missed the turn into Darlington's driveway and had to double back twice before she spotted the thick stone columns that marked the entry to Black Elm. The lamps that lined the drive were lit, bright halos that made the bare branch trees look soft and friendly like a winter postcard. The bulky shape of the house came into view, and Alex slammed her foot down on the brakes. A light glowed in the kitchen window, bright as a beacon, another up in the high tower, Darlington's bedroom. She remembered his body curled against hers, the cloudy panes of the narrow window, the sea of black branches below, the dark woods separating Black Elm from the world outside. Hurriedly, Alex turned off the headlights and the engine. If someone was here, if something was here, she didn't want to scare it away. Her boots on the gravel drive sounded impossibly loud, but she wasn't sneaking, no, she wasn't sneaking. She was just walking up to the kitchen door. She had the keys in her hand. She was welcome here. It could be his mom or dad, she told herself. She didn't know much about Darlington's family, but he had to have one. Another relative. Someone else Sando had hired to look after the place when Dawes was busy. All of those things were more likely, but... He's here, her heart insisted pounding so hard in her chest she had to pause at the door, make herself breathe more steadily. He's here. The thought pulled her along like a child who had hold of her sleeve. She peered in through the window, safe in the dark. The kitchen was all warm wood and patterned blue tiles. The tiles are delft, a big brick hearth and copper pots gleaming from their hooks. Mail was stacked on the kitchen island, as if someone had been in the middle of sorting it. He's here. Alex thought of knocking, fumbled with the keys instead. The second one turned in the lock. She entered, gently shut the door behind her. The merry light of the kitchen was warm, welcoming, reflected back in flat copper pans, caught in the creamy green enamel of the stove that someone had installed in the fifties. Hello, she said, her voice a breath. The sound of the keys dropping onto the counter made an unexpectedly loud jangle. Alex stood guiltily in the middle of the kitchen, waiting for someone to chastise her, maybe even the house. But this was not the mansion on Orange with its hopeful creaks and disapproving sighs. Darlington had been the life of this place, and without him the house felt huge and empty, a shipwreck hole. Ever since that night at Rosenfeld Hall, Alex would catch herself hoping that maybe this was all a test, one given to every Lethe house apprentice, and that Dawes and Sando and Turner were all in on it. Darlington was in his third-floor bedroom, hiding out right now. He'd heard the car in the driveway. 
he'd raced up the stairs and was huddling there, in the dark, waiting for her to leave. The murder could be part of it too. There was no dead girl. Tara Hutchins would come waltzing down the stairs herself when this was all over. They just had to be sure Alex could handle something serious on her own. It was absurd. Even so, that voice persisted, he's here. Sando had said he might still be alive, that they could bring him back. He'd said all they needed was a new moon, the right magic, and everything would be the way it had been before. But maybe Darlington had found his own way back. He could do anything. He could do this. She drifted farther into the house. The lights from the driveway cast a yellowy dimness over the rooms, the butler's pantry, with its white cupboards full of dishes and glasses, the big walk-in freezer, with its metal door so like the one at the morgue, the formal dining room, with its mirror-shine table like a dark lake in a silent glade, and then the vast living room, with its big black window looking out over the dim shapes of the garden, the humps of hedges and skeletal trees. There was another, smaller room off the main living room, full of big couches, a TV, gaming consoles. Len would have wet himself over the size of the screen. It was very much a room he would have loved, maybe the only thing he and Darlington had in common. Well, not the only thing. Most of the rooms on the second floor were closed up. This was where I ran out of money, he'd told her, his arms slung across her shoulders, as she'd tried to move him along. The house was like a body that had cut off circulation to all but the most vital parts of itself in order to survive. An old ballroom had been turned into a kind of makeshift gym. A speed bag hung from the ceiling on a rack. Big metal weights, medicine balls, and fencing foils were stacked on the wall, and heavy machines loomed against the windows like bulky insects. She followed the stairs to the top floor and wound her way down the hall. The door to Darlington's room was open. He's here. Again, the certainty came at her, but worse this time. He'd left the light on for her. He wanted her to find him. He would be sitting in his bed, long legs crossed, bent over a book, dark hair falling over his forehead. He would look up, cross his arms. It's about time. She wanted to run toward that square of light, but she forced herself to take measured steps, a bride approaching an altar, her certainty draining away, the refrain of he's here shifting from one step to the next until she realized she was praying, be here, be here, be here. The room was empty. It was small compared to the lodgings at I.L. Bastone, a strange round room that had clearly never been meant to be a bedroom and somehow reminded her of a monk's chamber. It looked exactly as she had last seen it, the desk pushed against one curved wall, a yellowing newspaper clipping of an old roller coaster taped above it, as if it had been forgotten there, a mini-fridge, because of course Darlington wouldn't want to stop reading or working to go downstairs for sustenance, a high-backed chair placed by the window for reading. There were no bookshelves, only stacks and stacks of books piled at varying heights, as if he had been in the process of walling himself in with colored bricks. The desk lamp cast a circle of light over an open book, Meditations on the Tarot, a journey into Christian Hermeticism. Dawes. Dawes had come to see to the house, to sort the mail, to take the car out. Dawes had come to this room to study, to be closer to him. Maybe to wait for him. She'd been called away suddenly, left the lights on, assumed she'd be back that evening to take care of it. But Alex had been the one to return the car. It was that simple. Darlington was not in Spain. He was not home. He was never coming home. And it was all Alex's fault. A white shape cut through the dark from the corner of her vision. She leapt backward, knocking over a pile of books, and swore. But it was just Cosmo. Darlington's cat. He prowled the edge of the desk, nudging up against the warmth of the desk lamp. Alex always thought of him as Bowie Cat because of his marked-up eye and streaky white fur that looked like one of the wigs Bowie had worn in Labyrinth. He was stupid affectionate, 
all you had to do was hold your hand out and he would nuzzle your knuckles. Alec sat down on the edge of Darlington's narrow bed. It was neatly made, probably by Dawes. Had she sat here too? Slept here? Alex remembered Darlington's delicate feet, his scream as he'd vanished. She held her hand down, beckoning to the cat. Hey, Cosmo. He stared at her with his mismatched eyes, the pupil of the left like an ink blot. Come on, Cosmo. I didn't mean for it to happen. Not really. Cosmo padded across the room. As soon as his small sleek head touched Alex's fingers, she began to cry. Alex slept in Darlington's bed and dreamed that he was curled behind her on the narrow mattress. He pulled her close, his fingers digging into her abdomen, and she could feel claws at their tips. He whispered in her ear, I will serve you till the end of days. And love me, she said with a laugh, bold in the dream, unafraid. But all he said was, it is not the same. Alex woke with a start, flopped over, gazed at the sharp pitch of the roof, the trees beyond the window striping the ceiling in shadow and hard winter sun. She'd been scared to try fiddling with the thermostat, so she'd bundled herself in three of Darlington's sweaters and an ugly brown hat she'd found on top of his dresser but that she'd never seen him wear. She remade the bed, then headed downstairs to fill Cosmo's water dish and eat some fancy nuts and twigs dry cereal from a box in the pantry. Alex took her laptop from her bag and went to the dusty sunroom that ran the length of the first floor. She gazed out at the backyard. The slope of the hill led to a hedge maze overgrown with brambles, and she could see some kind of statue or fountain at its center. She wasn't sure where the grounds left off, and she wondered just how much of this particular hill the Arlington family owned. It took her nearly two hours to write up her report on the Tara Hutchins murder. Cause of death. Time of death. The behavior of the greys at the skull and bones prognostication. She'd hesitated over that last, but Lethe had brought her here for what she could see and there was no reason for her. To lie about it. She mentioned the information she gleaned from the coroner and from Turner in his capacity as centurion, noting Tripp's name coming up and also Turner's belief that the bones man was not involved. She hoped Turner wouldn't mention her visit to the morgue. At the end of the incident report, there was a section titled Findings. Alex thought for a long time, her hand idly stroking Cosmo's fur as he purred beside her on the old wicker love seat. In the end, she said nothing about the strange feeling she'd had at the crime scene or that she suspected Tara and Lance were probably dealing to other members of the other societies. Centurion will update Dante on his findings, but at this time all evidence suggests this was a crime committed by Tara's boyfriend while under the influence of powerful hallucinogenics and that there is no connection to Lethe or the Houses of the Vale. She read through twice more for punctuation and to try to make her answers sound as Darlingtonish as possible, then she sent the report to Sando with Dawes cc'd. Cosmo meowed plaintively as Alex slipped out the kitchen door but it felt good to leave the house behind her, breathe the icy air. The sky was bright blue, scrubbed clean of clouds, and the gravel of the drive glittered. She put the Mercedes in the garage, then walked to the end of the driveway and called a car. She could return the keys to Dawes later. If her roommates asked where she had been, she would just say she'd spent the night at Darlington's. Family Emergency the excuse had long since worn thin, but there would be fewer late nights and unexplained absences from now on. She'd done right by Tara. Lance would be punished and Alex's conscience was off the hook, for this at least. Tonight she'd nurse a beer while her roommate got shit-faced on peppermint schnapps via ice luge at Omega Meltdown, and tomorrow she'd spend all day catching up on her reading. She had the driver drop her in front of the fancy minimart on Elm. It wasn't until she was already inside the store that she realized she was still wearing Darlington's hat. She slid it off her head, then jammed it back on. It was cold. She didn't need to be sentimental about a hat. 
Alex filled her basket with Chex Mix, Twizzlers, sour gummy worms. She shouldn't be spending so much money, but she craved the comfort of junk food. She reached into the drinks case, rooting back for a chocolate. Milk with a better expiration date, and felt something brush her hand, fingertips caressing her knuckles. Alex yanked her arm back, cradling her hand to her chest as if it had been burned, and slammed the case door closed with a rattle, heart pounding. She stepped back from the case, waiting for something to come crashing through, but nothing happened. She looked around, embarrassed. A guy sporting little round glasses and a navy Yale sweatshirt glanced at her. She bent to pick up her shopping basket, using the chance to shut her eyes and take a deep breath. Imagination. Sleep deprivation. Just general jumpiness. Hell, maybe even a rat. But she'd pop in at the hutch. It was right across the street. She could slip behind the wards to gather her thoughts in a grayless environment. She grabbed her basket and stood. The guy with the little glasses had come up next to her and was standing far too close. She couldn't see his eyes just the light reflecting off the lenses. He smiled and something moved at the corner of his mouth. Alex realized it was the waving black feeler of an insect. A beetle crawled from the pocket of his cheek as if he'd been keeping it there like chewing tobacco. It dropped from his lips. Alex leapt back, stifling a scream. Too slow. The thing in the blue sweatshirt, seized the back of her neck and slammed her head into the door of the refrigerator case. The glass shattered. Alex felt the shards slice into her skin, warm blood trickling down her cheeks. He yanked her back, threw her to the ground. You can't touch me. It isn't allowed. Still, after all these years and all these horrors, that stupid, childish response. She staggered away. The woman behind the register was shouting, her husband emerging from the back room with wide eyes. The man in glasses advanced. Not a man. A gray. But what had drawn him and helped him cross over? And why didn't he seem like any gray she'd ever seen? His skin no longer looked human. It had a sheer, glass-like quality through which she could see his veins and the shadows of his bones. He stank of the veil. Alex dug in her pockets, but she hadn't replenished her supplies of graveyard dirt. She almost always had some on her, just in case. Take courage, she cried. No one is immortal. The death words she'd repeated to herself every day since Darlington had taught them to her. But the thing showed no sign of distress or distraction. The shop owners were yelling. One of them had a phone in his hand. Yes, call the police. But they were screaming at her, not at him. They couldn't see him. All they saw was a girl smashing their drinks case and tearing up their store. Alex launched to her feet. She had to get to the hutch. She slammed through the door and out onto the sidewalk. Hey, cried a girl with a green coat as Alex smacked into her. The store owner followed, bellowing for someone to stop her. Alex glanced back. The thing with glasses glided around the owner and then seemed to leap over the crowd. His hand latched onto Alex's throat. She stumbled off the lip of the curb, into the street. Horns blared. She heard the screech of tires. She couldn't breathe. She saw Jonas read on the corner, staring. He was in her English section. She remembered Megan's startled face, the surprise giving way to disgust. She could hear Ms. Rosella's gasp, Alex. Sweetheart. She was going to get choked out in the middle of the street and no one could see it, no one could stop it. Take courage, she tried to say, but only a rasp emerged. Alex looked around desperately, eyes watering, face suffused with blood. They can't get to you now, Darlington had promised. She'd known it wasn't true, but she'd let herself believe that she could be protected, because it had made everything bearable. Her hands scrabbled against the thing's skin, 
it was hard and slippery as glass. She saw something burble up from the clear flesh of its throat, cloudy, dark red. His lips parted. He released her neck and, before she could stop herself, she inhaled sharply, just as he blew a stream of red dust into her face. Pain exploded through her chest in sharp bursts as the dust entered her lungs. She tried to cough, but the thing sat with his knees pressing down on her shoulders as she struggled to buck free. People were yelling. She heard a siren wail, but she knew the ambulance would be too late. She would die here in Darlington's stupid hat. Maybe he'd be waiting on the other side of the veil with Hell Lai. And Len. And all of the others. The world fluttered black, and then suddenly she could move. The weight vanished from her shoulders. She released a grunt and shoved to her. Feet, clutching her chest, trying to find her breath. Where had the monster gone? She looked up. High above the intersection, the thing with the glasses was grappling with something. No, someone. A gray. The bridegroom, New Haven's favorite murder-suicide, with his fancy suit and silent movie star hair. The thing in glasses had hold of his lapels and he flickered slightly in the sun as they careened through the air, slammed into a streetlight that sparked to life and then dimmed, passed through the walls of a building and back out. The whole street seemed to shake as if rumbling with thunder, but Alex knew only she could hear it. The squeal of brakes cut through the noise. A black and white was pulling up on York, followed by an ambulance. Alex took a last look at the bridegroom's face, his mouth pulled back in a grimace as he launched his fist at his opponent. She bolted across the intersection. The pain in her chest continued to unfurl in popping bursts like fireworks. Something had happened to her, something bad, and she didn't know how much longer she'd be able to stay conscious. She only knew she had to get to the hutch, upstairs to the safety of Lethe's hidden rooms. There might be other greys coming, other monsters. What could they do? What couldn't they do? She needed to get behind the wards. She glanced over her shoulder and saw an EMT running toward her. She leapt up on the sidewalk, around the corner, and then into the alley. He was right behind, but he couldn't protect her. She would die in his care. She knew this. She dodged left, toward the doorway, out of view. It's me, she cried out to the hutch, praying it would know her. The door blew open and the steps rolled toward her, pulling her inside. She tried to take the stairs on her feet, but slid to her knees. Usually the smell of the hall was comforting, a winter smell of burning wood, cranberries cooking slowly, mulled wine. Now it made her stomach churn. It's the uncanny, she realized. The garbage stink of the alley outside had at least been real. These false smells of comfort were too much. Her system couldn't handle any more magic. She fastened one hand around the iron railing the other braced against the lip of the stone step, and pushed herself up. She saw spots on the concrete, black stars blooming in lichen clusters on the stairs. Her blood, dripping from her lips. Panic reeled through her. She was on the floor, in that public bathroom. The broken monarch flapped its one able wing. Get up. Blood can draw them. Darlington's voice in her head. Greys can cross the line if they want something badly enough. What if the wards didn't hold? What if they weren't built to keep something like that monster out? The bridegroom had seemed to be winning. And if he won? Who said he'd be any gentler than the thing in glasses? He hadn't looked gentle at all. She tapped a message into her phone to Dawes. SOS. 911. There was probably some code she was supposed to use for bleeding from the mouth, but Dawes would just have to make do. If Dawes was at I.L. Bastone and not here at the hutch, Alex was going to die on these stairs. She could see the grad student clearly, sitting in the parlor of the house on Orange, those index cards she used to organize chapters spread out like the tarot before her, all of them reading disaster, failure. 
the queen of pointlessness, a girl with a cleaver over her head. The debtor, a boy crushed beneath a rock. The student, daws herself in a cage of her own making. All while Alex bled to death a mile away. Alex dragged herself up another step. She had to get behind the doors. The safe houses were a matryoshka doll of safety. The hutch. Where small animals went to ground. A wave of nausea rolled through her. She retched and a gout of black bile poured from her mouth. It was moving on the stairs. She saw the wet, shiny backs of beetles. Scarabs. Bits of iridescent carapace glinting in whatever blood and sludge had erupted from her. She shoved past the mess she'd made, retching again, even as her mind tried to make sense of what was happening to her. What had that thing wanted from her? Had someone sent it after her? If she died, her petty heart wanted to know who to haunt. The stairwell was fading in and out now. She was not going to make it. She heard a metallic clang and a moment later understood it was the door banging open somewhere above her. Alex tried to cry out for help, but the sound from her mouth was a small, wet whimper. The smack of Dawes's tevas echoed down the stairs as a pause, then her footsteps, faster now, punctuated by fuck 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 fuck. Alex felt a solid arm beneath her, yanking her upward. Jesus. Jesus. What happened? Help me, Pammy. Dawes flinched. Why had Alex used that name? Only Darlington called Dawes that. Her legs felt heavy as Dawes hauled her up the stairs. Her skin itched as if something was crawling beneath it. She thought of the beetles pouring from her mouth and retched again. Don't vomit on me, said Dawes. If you vomit, I'll vomit. Alex thought of Helli holding her hair back. They'd gotten drunk on Jaeger and then sat on the bathroom floor at ground zero, laughing and puking and brushing their teeth, then doing it all over again. Move your legs, Alex, Helli said. She was pushing Alex's knees aside, slumping down next to her in the big basket chair. She smelled like coconut and her body was warm, always warm, like the sun loved her, like it wanted to cling to her golden skin as long as possible. Move your stupid legs, Alex. Not hell I. Dawes, shouting in her ear. I am. You're not. Come on, give me three more steps. Alex wanted to warn Dawes that the thing was coming. The death words hadn't affected it. Maybe the wards wouldn't stop it either. She opened her mouth and vomited again. Dawes heaved in response. Then they were on the landing, through the door, toppling forward. Alex found herself falling. She was on the floor of the hutch, face pressed to the threadbare carpet. What happened? Dawes asked, but Alex was too tired to reply. She felt herself roll onto her back, a sharp slap across her face. Tell me what happened, Alex, or I can't fix it. Alex made herself look at Dawes. She didn't want to. She wanted to go back to the basket chair, hell I like a glowing slice of sun beside her. A gray, I don't know. Like glass. I could see through him. Shit, that's a gluma. Alex needed her flashcards. The word was there, though, somewhere in her memory. A gluma was a husk, a spirit raised from the recently dead, to pass through the world go-betweens who could travel across the veil. They were messengers. For book and snake. There was red smoke. I breathed it in. She heaved again. Corpse beetles. They'll eat you from the inside out. Of course. Of course they would. Because magic was never good or kind. She heard bustling and then felt a cup pressed to her lips. Drink said Dawes. It's going to hurt like hell and blister the skin right off your throat, but I can heal that. Dawes was tipping Alex's chin up, forcing her mouth open. Alex's throat caught fire. 
she had a vision of prairies lit by blue flame. The pain seared through her, and she grabbed Dawes by the hand. Jesus, Alex, why are you smiling? The gluma. The husk. Someone had sent something after her, and there could only be one reason why. Alex was onto something. They knew she had gone to see Tara's body. But who? Book and snake? Skull and bones? Whoever it was had no reason to think she would stop with a visit to the morgue. They didn't know the choice she'd made, that the report had already been filed. Alex had been right. There was something wrong with Tara's death, some connection to the societies, the houses of the Vale. But that wasn't why she was smiling. They tried to kill me, hell lie, she rasped as she slid into the dark. That means I get to try to kill them. 10. Last Fall The night of the manuscript party, Darlington spent the early evening hours with the windows of Black Elm lit, handing out candy, jack-o'-lanterns lining the driveway. He loved this part of Halloween, the ritual of it, the tide of happy strangers arriving on his shores, hands outstretched. Most times Black Elm felt like a dark island, one that had somehow ceased to appear on any chart. Not on Halloween night. The house lay in the gentle swell of a hill not far from the lands that had once belonged to Donald Grant Mitchell, and its library was stocked with multiple copies of Mitchell's books, Reveries of a Bachelor, Dream Life, and the only title his grandfather had deemed worth reading, My Farm of Edgewood. As a boy, Darlington had been drawn in by the mysterious sound of Mitchell's pen name, Ick Marvel, and woefully disappointed by the lack of anything magical or marvelous in his books. But that had been his feeling about everything. There should be more magic. Not the creased grease paint performances of clowns and hack illusionists. Not card tricks. The magic he'd been promised would be found at the backs of wardrobes, under bridges, through mirrors. It was dangerous and alluring, and it did not seek to entertain. Maybe if he'd been raised in an ordinary house with quality insulation and a neatly mowed front yard, instead of beneath Black Elm's crumbling towers, with its lakes of moss, its sudden, sinister spikes of foxglove, its seeping mist that crawled up through the trees in the autumn dusk, maybe then he would have stood a chance. Maybe if he'd been from somewhere like Phoenix instead of cursed New Haven. The moment that doomed him hadn't even really belonged to him. He was eleven years old, at a picnic organized by the Knights of Columbus, which their housekeeper Bernadette had insisted on bringing him to because boys need fresh air. Once they'd arrived at Lighthouse Point, she sequestered herself beneath a tent with her friends and a plate of deviled eggs and told him to go play. Darlington had found a group of boys around his age, or they'd found him, and they spent the afternoon running races and competing in carnival games then inventing their own games when those got boring. A tall boy named Mason, with buzzed hair and buck teeth, had somehow become the day's decision-maker, when to eat, when to swim, when a game got dull, and Darlington was happy to follow in his wake. When they tired of riding the old carousel, they walked down to the edge of the park that looked out over the Long Island Sound and the New Haven Harbor in the distance. They should have boats, said Mason like a speedboat. Or a jet ski, said a boy named Liam. That would be cool. Yeah, said another kid. We could go across to the roller coaster. He'd been tagging along with them all afternoon. He was small, his face dense with sand-colored freckles and now sunburned across the nose. What roller coaster? Mason asked. The freckled kid had pointed across the sound with all the lights on it. Next to the pier. Darlington had looked into the distance, but seen nothing there, just the fading day in a flat spit of land. Mason stared, then said, What the fuck are you talking about? Even in the growing twilight, Darlington had seen red spreading hot across the freckled kid's face. The kid laughed. Nothing. I was just fucking with you. Tool. They'd walked down to the thin sliver of beach to run back and forth in the waves, and the moment had been forgotten. Until months later, 
when Darlington's grandfather opened his paper at the breakfast table and Darlington saw the headline, Remembering Savon Rock. Beneath it was a picture of a big wooden roller coaster jutting into the waters of the long island sound. The caption read, The legendary Thunderbolt, a favorite at Savon Rock Amusement Park, destroyed by a hurricane in 1938. Darlington had cut the picture from the paper and taped it above his desk. That day at Lighthouse Point, that sunburned, freckled boy had seen the old roller coaster. He believed they could all see it. He hadn't been pretending or joking around. He'd been surprised and embarrassed, and then he'd shut up quick. As if he'd had something like that happen before. Darlington had tried to remember his name. He'd asked Bernadette if they could go to the Knights of Columbus for bingo, potluck dinners, anything that might put him back in that kid's path. Eventually, his grandfather had put a stop to it with a growl stop trying to turn him into a goddamn Catholic. Darlington had grown older. The memory of Lighthouse Point had grown dimmer. But he never took the picture of the thunderbolt from his wall. He would forget about it for weeks, sometimes months at a time, but he could never shake the thought that he was seeing only one world when there might be many, that there were lost places, maybe even lost people who might come to life for him if he just squinted hard enough or found the right magic words. Books, with their promises of enchanted doorways and secret places, only made it worse. The feeling should have ebbed away with time, worn down by the constant, gentle disappointments of growing up. But at sixteen, with his brand new provisional driver's license tucked into his wallet, the first place Darlington had taken his grandfather's old Mercedes was Lighthouse Point. He'd stood at the edge of the water and waited for the world to reveal itself. Years later, when he met Alex Stern, he had to resist the urge to bring her there too, to see if the thunderbolt might appear to her like any other gray, a rumbling ghost of joy and giddy terror. When full dark fell and the stream of children in their goblin masks slowed to a trickle, Darlington put on his own costume, the same one he wore every year, a black coat and a pair of cheap plastic fangs that made him look like he'd just had dental surgery. He parked in the alley behind the hutch, where Alex was waiting, shivering in a long black coat that he'd never seen before. Can't we drive? she asked. It's freezing. Californians. It's fifty degrees and we're walking three blocks. Somehow you'll manage this journey through the tundra. I pray you're not wearing a skimpy cat ensemble underneath that. We're supposed to project some measure of authority. I can do my job in hot pants. I can probably do it better. She executed a half-hearted karate kick. More room to move. At least she'd worn practical boots. In the light from the street lamp, he could see she'd heavily lined her eyes and had big gold earrings on. Hopefully she hadn't worn anything too provocative or appropriative. He didn't want to spend the evening fielding judgmental snipes from manuscript because Alex had felt the urge to dress as sexy Pocahontas. He led them up the alley and on to Elm. She seemed alert, ready. She'd done well since the incident at Aurelian since they'd smashed a few thousand dollars worth of glass and china on I.L. Bastone's kitchen floor. Maybe Darlington had done a little better too. They'd watched a series of first transformations at Wolf's Head that had gone without incident, though Shane McKay had trouble coming down and they had to pen him in the kitchen while he shook off his rooster form. He bloodied his nose trying to peck the table and one of his friends had spent an hour dutifully plucking tiny white feathers from his body. The cock jokes had been interminable. They'd monitored a raising at Book and Snake, where, with the help of a translator, a desiccated corpse had relayed the final accounts of recently dead soldiers in the Ukraine in a bizarre game of macabre telephone. Darlington didn't know who in the State Department had requested the information, but he assumed it would be dutifully passed along. They'd observed an unsuccessful portal opening at Scroll and Key a botched attempt to send someone to Hungary, which had resulted in nothing but the whole tomb smelling like goulash, and an equally unimpressive storm summoning by St. Elmo at their dump of an apartment on Linwood, 
which had left the delegation president and attending alumni sheepish and ashamed. They all have the look a guy gets when he's too drunk to get it up, Alex had whispered. Must you be so vulgar, stern? Tell me I'm wrong, Darlington. I certainly wouldn't know. Tonight would be a bit different. They would draw no circles of protection, only make their presence known, monitor the power being gathered at the manuscript nexus, and then write up a report. How long will we be at this thing? Alex asked as the street forked left. After midnight, maybe a little later. I told Mercy and Lauren I'd meet them at the Pearson Inferno. They'll be so wasted by then they're not going to notice if you're late. Now focus, manuscript looks harmless, but they're not. Alex cut him a glance. There was some kind of glitter on her cheeks. You actually sound nervous. Of all the societies, the one that made Darlington most wary was manuscript. He could see the skepticism on Alex's face as they stopped in front of a grubby white brick wall. Here, she asked, drawing her coat tighter. The thump of bass and murmur of conversation floated back to them from somewhere down the narrow walkway. Darlington understood Alex's disbelief. The other tombs had been built to look like tombs, the flat Neo-Egyptian plinths of bones, the soaring white columns of book and snake, the delicate screens and Moorish arches of scroll and key, Darlington's favorite crypt. Even Wolf's head, who had claimed they wanted to shake off the trappings of the arcane and establish a more egalitarian house, had built themselves an English country estate in miniature. Darlington had read the descriptions of each tomb in Pinnell's Guide to Yale and felt that, somehow, the analysis of their parts had fallen short of the mystery they evoked. Of course, Pinnell hadn't known about the tunnel beneath Grove Street that led directly from Book and Snake to the heart of the cemetery, or the enchanted orange trees taken from the Alhambra that bore fruit year-round in the scroll and key courtyard. But the exterior of manuscript just looked like a squat brick lump with a bunch of recycling bins stacked along its side. This is it? Alex asked. This is sadder than that place on Linwood. Actually, nothing was sadder than the St. Elmo house on Linwood, with its stained carpet and sagging stairs and roof spiked with tilting weather vanes. Don't judge a book, Stern. This crypt is eight stories deep and houses one of the best collections of contemporary art in the world. Alex's brows shot up. So they're Cali Rich. Cali Rich? In L.A., the really loaded guys dress like bums, like they need everyone to know they live at the beach. I suspect Manuscript was aiming for understated elegance, not I bang models at my Malibu manse, but who can say? The tomb had been finished in the early sixties by King Lu Wu. Darlington had never managed more than a grudging respect for mid-century architecture. Despite his best attempts to admire its severe lines, its clean execution, it always fell flat for him. His father had openly mocked his son's bourgeois taste for turrets and gabled roofs. Here, Darlington said, taking Alex by the shoulders and walking her a little to the left. Look. It pleased him when she exclaimed, Oh. At this angle, the circular pattern hidden in the white bricks emerged. Most people thought it represented a sun, but Darlington knew better. It can't be seen head on, said Darlington. Nothing here can. This is the house of illusions and lies. Keep in mind just how charismatic some of these people can be. Our job is to make sure that no one gets too out of line and no one gets hurt. There was an incident in 1982. What kind of incident? A girl ate something at one of these parties and decided she was a tiger. Alex shrugged. I watched Salome Nils pull feathers out of a guy's butt in the wolf's head kitchen. Pretty sure it could be worse. She never stopped thinking she was a tiger. What? Wolf's head is all about changing the physical, relinquishing human form, but retaining human awareness. Manuscript specializes in altering consciousness. Messing with your head. That girl's parents still have her in a cage in upstate New York. 
It's a pretty nice setup. Acres to run on. Raw meat twice a day. She got out once and tried to maul their mailman. Hell on a manicure. She had him down on the ground and was chewing on his calf. We covered it up as a mental breakdown. Manuscript paid for all of her care and was suspended from activity for a semester. Harsh justice. I didn't say it was fair, Stern. Not much is. But I'm telling you, you cannot trust your own perception tonight. Manuscripts magics are all about tricking the senses. Don't eat or drink anything. Keep your wits about you. I don't want to have to send you upstate with your own ball of yarn. They followed a cluster of girls dressed in corsets and zombie makeup down the narrow alley and in through the side door. Henry Eight's wives. And Bullen's neck was covered in sticky looking fake blood. Kate Masters perched on a stool by the door with a hand stamp, but Darlington snatched Alex's wrist before she could offer it up. You don't know what's in the stamped eye, he murmured. You can just let us through, Kate. Coat room to the left. She winked, red glitter sparkling on her lids. She was dressed as poison ivy, construction paper leaves stapled onto a green bustier. Inside, the music thumped and wailed, the heat of bodies washing over them in a gust of perfume and moist air. The big square room was dimly lit, packed with people circling skull-shaped vats of punch, the back garden strewn with strings of twinkling lights beyond. Darlington was already starting to sweat. Doesn't look so bad, said Alex. Remember what I said? The real party is down below. So nine levels total? Nine circles of hell? No, it's based around Chinese mythology. Eight is considered the luckiest number, so eight secret levels. The staircase represents a divine spiral. Alex shucked off her coat. Beneath it she wore a black sheath dress. Her shoulders were strewn with a cascade of silver stars. What are you supposed to be? he asked. A girl in black, with a lot of eye makeup on? She pulled a crown of plastic flowers sprayed with silver paint from her coat pocket and settled it on her head. Queen Mab. You didn't strike me as a Shakespeare fan. I'm not. Lauren got a puck costume from the Dramat closet. Mercy's going as Titania, so she shoved me in this and said I could be Mab. You know Shakespeare called Mab the fairy's midwife. Alex frowned. I thought she was the queen of the night. That too. It suits you. Darlington had meant it to be a compliment, but Alex scowled. It's just a dress. What have I been trying to tell you? Darlington said. Nothing is ever just anything. And maybe he wanted her to be the kind of girl who dressed as Queen Mab, who loved words and had stars in her blood. Let's walk the first floor before we tackle what lies beneath. It didn't take them long. Manuscript had been built on the open floor plans popular in the fifties and sixties, so there were few rooms or passages to investigate. At least on this level. I don't get it, Alex murmured as they glanced around the scrubby backyard. It was too crowded for comfort, but nothing out of the ordinary seemed to be happening. If tonight is so special to manuscript, why perform a rite with so many people around? It's not a rite precisely. It's a culling. But that's the problem with their magic. It can't be practiced in seclusion. Mirror magic is all about reflection and perception. A lie isn't a lie until someone believes it. It doesn't matter how charming you are if there's no one to charm. Everybody on this floor is powering what happens below. Just by having a good time? By trying to. Look around. What do you see? People in costumes, horns, false jewels, adorning themselves in tiny layers of illusion. They stand up straighter, suck in their stomachs, say things they don't mean, indulge in flattery. They commit a thousand small acts of deception, lying to each other, lying to themselves, 
drinking to the point of delusion to make it easier. This is a night of compacts, between the seers and the seen, a night when people enter false bargains willingly, hoping to be duped and to dupe in turn for the pleasure of feeling brave or sexy or beautiful or simply wanted, no matter how fleetingly. Darlington, are you telling me manuscript is powered by beer goggles? You do have a way of cutting straight to it, Stern. Every weekend night, every party is a series of these bargains, but Halloween compounds it all. These people enter the pact when they walk through that door, full of anticipation. Even before that, when they put on their wings and horns, he shot her a glance, and glitter. Didn't someone say love is a shared delusion? Cynical, Darlington. Doesn't suit you at all. Call it magic, if you prefer. Two people reciting the same spell. Well, I like it, said Alex. It looks like a party from a movie. But the greys are all over it. He knew that and yet it still surprised him. After so long, he felt he should be able to sense their presence in some way. Darlington tried to step back, see this place as Alex did, but it just looked like a party. Halloween was a night when the dead came alive because the living were more alive, happy children high on candy, angry teenagers with eggs and shaving cream tucked into their hoodies, drunk college students in masks and wings and horns giving themselves permission to be something else, angel, demon, devil, good doctor, bad nurse. The sweat and excitement, the over-sugared punches loaded with fruit and grain alcohol. The greys could not resist. Who's here? he asked. Her dark brows shot up. You want specifics? I'm not asking you to endanger yourself for the sake of my curiosity. Just an overview. 6. Last fall. He started her small, with Aurelian. Darlington figured the big magics could wait for later in the semester, and he knew he'd made the right choice when he came downstairs at I.L. Bastone to find Alex perched on the edge of a velvet cushion, gnawing feverishly on a thumbnail. Dawes seemed oblivious, her attention focused on a companion to Linear B her noise-canceling headphones firmly in place. Ready, he asked. Alex stood and wiped her palms on her jeans. He had her run through the stock of protections in their bags, and Darlington was pleased to see she'd forgotten nothing. Good night, Dawes, he said as they unhooked their coats from the hall rack. We won't be home late. Dawes slid her headphones down to her neck. We have smoked salmon and egg and dill sandwiches. Dare I ask? And Avgolamono. I'd say you're an angel, but you're so much more interesting. Dawes clucked her tongue. It's really not a fall soup. It's barely fall, and there's nothing more fortifying. Besides, after a shot of Hiram's elixir it was tough to get warm. Dawes smiled as she returned to her text. She liked being praised for her cooking almost as much as she liked being acknowledged for her scholarship. The air felt bright and cold against his skin as they walked down Orange, back toward the green campus. Spring came on slow in New England, but fall was like rounding a sharp turn. One moment you were sweating through summer cotton, and the next you shivered beneath a sky gone hard enamel blue. Tell me about Aurelian. Alex blew out a breath. Founded in 1910. Rooms consecrated in Sheffield Sterling Strathcona Hall. Save yourself the mouthful. Everyone calls it SSS. SSS. During the 1932 renovations. Around the same time Bones was sealing off their operating theater, Darlington added. They're what? You'll learn during your first prognostication but I thought we'd keep the training wheels on for our first journey out. Best that Alex Stern found her footing among the eager, generous Aurelians rather than in front of the Bonesmen. The university gave those rooms to Aurelian as a gift for services rendered. Which services? You tell me, Stern. Well, they specialize in logomancy, word magic. So something with a contract? 
the purchase of Sachem's Wood, in 1910. It was a huge acquisition of land, and the university wanted to make sure the purchase could never be challenged. That land became Science Hill. What else? People don't take them very seriously. People? Lethe, she amended. The other societies. Because they don't have a real tomb. But we're not like those people, Stern. We aren't snobs. You're most definitely a snob, Darlington. Well, I'm not that particular kind of snob. We have only two real concerns. Does their magic work, and is it dangerous? Does it? asked Alex. Is it? The answer to both questions is sometimes. Aurelian specializes in unbreakable contracts, binding vows, stories that can literally put the reader to sleep. In 1989 a certain millionaire slipped into a coma in the cabin of his yacht. A copy of God and Man at Yale was found beside him and if anyone had thought to look they would have found an introduction that exists in no other version, one composed by Aurelian. You may also be interested to know that Winston Churchill's last words were, I'm bored with it all. You're saying Aurelian assassinated Winston Churchill? That's mere speculation. But I can confirm that half of the dead in Grove Street Cemetery only stay in their graves because the inscriptions on their tombstones were crafted by members of Aurelian. Sounds pretty powerful to me. That was the old magic, when they were still considered a landed society. Aurelian was kicked out of their rooms when union contract negotiations with the university soured. The charge was serving alcohol to minors, but the fact is that Yale felt Aurelian had botched the initial contracts. They lost room 405, and their work has been shaky ever since. These days, they mostly manage the occasional non-disclosure agreement or inspiration spell. That's what we'll be seeing tonight. They passed the administrative offices of Woodbridge Hall and the glowing golden screens of Scroll and Key. The locksmiths had cancelled their next ritual. It wouldn't mean any less work for Lethe, Book and Snake had been happy to move into the Thursday night slot in their place, but Darlington wondered exactly what was going on at Key's. There had been rumors of weakening magic, portals that malfunctioned or didn't open at all. It might all be talk, the houses of the Vale were secretive, competitive, and prone to petty gossip. But Darlington would take the delay as an opportunity to dig into what Scroll and Key might be contending with before he dragged his Dante into a possible mess. If Aurelian isn't dangerous, why do we need to be there? Alex asked to keep the proceedings from being interrupted. This particular ritual tends to draw a lot of greys. Why? All of the blood. Alex's steps slowed. Please don't tell me you're squeamish. You won't make it through a semester if you can't handle a bit of gore. Darlington immediately felt like an ass. After what Alex had survived back in California, of course she'd be wary. This girl had witnessed real trauma, not the theater of the macabre to which Darlington had become so accustomed. I'll be fine, she said, but she was gripping the strap of her satchel with clenched fists. They entered the stark plateau of Beinecke Plaza, the library's windows glowing like chunks of amber. You will be, he promised. This is a controlled environment and a simple spell. We're basically just serving as bouncers tonight. Okay. She didn't look okay. They entered the stark plateau of Beinecke Plaza, the library's windows glowing like chunks of amber. You will be, he promised. This is a controlled environment and a simple spell. We're basically just serving as bouncers tonight. Okay. She didn't look okay. They pushed through the library's revolving door and into the high vault of the entry. Gordon Bunshaft had envisioned the library as a box within a box. Behind the empty security desk, a vast glass wall rose to the ceiling, packed with shelves of books. This was the real library, the stacks, the paper and parchment heart of Beinecke, the outer structure that surrounded it acting as entry, shield, and false skin. 
large windows on every side, showed the empty plaza beyond. A long table had been set up not far from the security desk, a comfortable distance away from the cases, where rotating exhibits from the library's collections were displayed and where the Gutenberg Bible was housed in its own little glass cube, lit from above. A single page of it was turned every day. God, he loved this place. The Aurelians were milling around the table, already in their ivory robes, chatting nervously. That giddy energy alone was probably enough to start drawing greys. Josh Zielinski, the delegation's current president, broke away from the group and hurried over to greet them. Darlington knew him from several American studies seminars. He had a mohawk, favored oversize overalls, and talked a lot. A woman in her forties trailed him, tonight's emperor, the alumna selected to supervise the ritual. Darlington recognized her from a right Aurelian had conducted the previous year to draw up governing documents for her condo board. Amelia, he said, reaching for the name. A pleasure to see you again. She smiled and glanced at Alex. Is this the new you? It was the same thing they'd asked Michelle Alamedin when she'd taken him around his freshman year. Meet our new Dante. Alex is from Los Angeles. Nice, said Zelinsky. Do you know any movie stars? I once swam naked in Oliver Stone's pool, does that count? Was he there? No. Zelinsky looked genuinely disappointed. We'll start at midnight, said Amelia. That gave them plenty of time to set up a perimeter around the ritual table. For this right, we can't block the greys out completely, Darlington explained as he and Alex walked a wide circle around the table, choosing the path of the boundary they would create. The magic requires that the channels with the veil remain open. Now tell me first steps. He'd assigned her excerpts from Fowler's bindings and also a short treatise on portal magic from the early days of scroll and key. Bone dust or graveyard dirt, or any memento mori to form the circle. Good, said Darlington. We'll use this tonight. He handed her a stick. Of chalk made from compressed crematory ash. It will allow us to be more precise in our markings. We'll leave channels open at each compass point. And then what? Then we work the doors. The greys can disrupt the ritual, and we don't want this kind of magic breaking loose. Magic needs resolution. Once this particular rite begins, it will be looking for blood, and if the spell gets free of the table, it could literally slice some nice law student studying a block away in two. One less lawyer to plague the world, but I'm told lawyer jokes are passe. So if a gray tries to come through, you have two options, dust them or death words. Greys loathed any reminder of death or dying, lamentations, dirges, poems about grief or loss, even a particularly well-phrased mortuary ad could do the trick. How about both? asked Alex. There's really no need. We don't waste power if we don't have to. She looked skeptical. Her anxiety surprised him. Alex Stern might be graceless and uneducated, but she'd shown plenty of nerve, at least when anything but moths were concerned. Where was the steel he'd glimpsed in her before? And why did her fear disappoint him so acutely? Just as they were finishing their markings to close the circle, a young man passed through the turnstile, his scarf pulled up nearly to his eyes. The guest of honor, murmured Darlington. Who is he? Zeb Yeroman, Wunderkind. Or former Wunderkind. Surely the Germans have a name for prodigies who age out of infant terrible. You would know, Darlington. Too cruel, stern. I have time yet. Zeb Yeroman wrote a novel his junior year at Yale, published it before he graduated, and was the darling of the New York literary scene for several years running. Good book? It wasn't bad, Darlington said. Malaise, madness, young love, the usual Bildungsroman fair, all set against the background of Zeb working at his uncle's failing dairy. But the prose did impress. 
so he's here to mentor someone? He's here because The King of Small Places was published almost eight years ago and Zeb Yeroman hasn't written a word since. Darlington saw Zelinsky signal to the emperor. It's time to start. The Aurelians had assembled in two even lines, facing each other on either side of the long table. They wore white cloaks almost like choir robes, with pointed sleeves so long they brushed the tabletop. Josh Zelinsky stood at one end, the emperor at the other. They put on white gloves of the type, used to handle archival manuscripts, and unfurled a scroll down the table's length. Parchment, said Darlington. Made from goatskin and soaked in elderflower. A gift for the muse. But that's not all she requires. Come on. He led Alex back to the first marks they'd made. You'll watch the southern and eastern gates. Don't stand between the markings unless you absolutely have to. If you see a gray approaching, just step into his path and use your graveyard dirt or speak the death words. I'll be monitoring the north and west. How? Her voice held a nervous, truculent edge. You can't even see them. Darlington reached into his pocket and removed the vial of elixir. He couldn't put it off any longer. He broke the wax covering, unstopped the cork, and, before thoughts of self-preservation could intrude, downed the contents. Darlington had never gotten used to it. He doubted he ever would, the urge to gag, the bitter spike that drove through his soft palate and up into the back of his skull. Fuck, he gasped. Alex blinked. I think that's the first time I've heard you swear. Chills shook him and he tried to control the tremors that quaked through his body. I cc class pp profanity with declarations of love. Best used sparingly and only when wholeheartedly mm meant. Darlington, are your teeth supposed to chatter? He tried to nod, but of course he was already nodding, spasming, really. The elixir was like dunking your head into the great cold, like stepping into a long, dark winter. Or as Michelle had once said, it's like getting an icicle shoved up your ass. Do you see the purple tongues? Darlington asked, bobbing his chin toward a boy covered in glitter pouring wine and a girl in cat ears and little else carrying a tray. They've taken Maridi, the drug of service. It's taken by acolytes to give up their will. Why would anyone do that? To serve me, said a soft voice. Darlington bowed to the figure dressed in celadone silk robes and a golden headdress that also served as a half-mask. How may we address you this night? Darlington inquired. The wearer of the mask represented Lan Siha, one of the eight immortals of Chinese myth, who could move amongst genders at will. At each gathering of manuscript, a different Siha was chosen. Tonight I am she. Her eyes were entirely white behind her mask. She would see all things this night and be deceived by no glamour. We thank you for the invitation, said Darlington. We always welcome the officers of Lethe, though we regret you never accept our hospitality. A glass of wine, perhaps? She raised a smooth hand, the nails curled like claws, but smooth and polished as glass, and one of the acolytes stepped forward with a pitcher. Darlington gave Alex a warning shake of his head. Thank you, he said apologetically. He knew some members of manuscript took personal offense that Lethe members never sampled the society's pleasures. But were bound by protocol. None of our suggestions for the freshman tap were accepted, said Lonsiha, her white eyes on Alex. Very disappointing. Darlington bristled. But Alex said, at least you won't expect much from me. Careful now, said Siha. I like to be disarmed. You may raise my expectations yet. Who glamoured your arms? Darlington. Are you ashamed of the tattoos? Sometimes. Darlington glanced at Alex, surprised. Was she under persuasion? But when he saw Lon Siha's pleased smile, he realized Alex was just playing the game. Seha liked surprises and candor was surprising. 
Seha reached out and ran a fingernail up the smooth skin of Alex's bare arm. We could erase them entirely, said Seha. Forever. For a small price, asked Alex. For a fair price. My lady, said Darlington in warning. Seha shrugged. This is a night of culling, when the stores are replenished and the casks are made full. No bargain will be made. Descend, boy, if you wish to know what's next. Descend and see what awaits you, if you dare. I just want to know if Jody Foster is here, Alex murmured as Lon Siha returned to the banquet table. She was one of Manuscript's most famous alums. For all you know that was Jody Foster, said Darlington, but his head felt heavy. His tongue felt too big for his mouth. Everything around him seemed to shimmer. Lon Siha turned to him from her place at the head of the banquet table. Descend. Darlington shouldn't have been able to hear the word at this distance, but it seemed to echo through his head. He felt the floor drop away, and he was falling. He stood in a vast cavern, carved into the earth, the rock slick with moisture, the air rich with the smell of turned soil. A hum filled his ears and Darlington realized it was coming from the mirror, the vault that still somehow hung on the cave wall. He was in the same room, but he was not. He looked into the mirror's swirling surface and the mists within it parted, the hum rising, vibrating through his bones. He shouldn't look. He knew that. You should never look into the face of the uncanny, but had he ever been able to turn away? No, he'd courted it, begged for it. He had to know. He wanted to know everything. He saw the banquet table reflected in the mirror, the food upon it going to rot the people around it still shoveling spoiled fruit and meat into their mouths along with the swirling flies. They were old, some barely strong enough to lift a cup of wine or a withering peach to their cracked lips. All but Lon Siha, who stood illumined by fire, the golden headdress aflame, her gown glowing ember red, the features of her face changing with each breath, high priestess, hermit, hierophant. For a moment, Darlington thought he glimpsed his grandfather there. He could feel his body quaking, felt dampness on his lips, touched his hand to his face and realized his nose had started to bleed. Darlington? Alex's voice, and in the mirror he saw her. But she looked the same. She was still Queen Mab. No. This time she really was Queen Mab. Night ebbed and flowed around her in a cape of glittering stars, above the oil-black sheaf of her hair, a constellation glowed, a wheel, a crown. Her eyes were black, her mouth the dark red of overripe cherries. He could feel power churning around her, through her. What are you? he whispered. But he didn't care. He went to his knees. This was what he'd been waiting for. Ah, said Lon Siha, approaching. An acolyte at heart. In the mirror, he saw himself, a knight with bowed head, offering his service, a sword in his hand, a sword in his back. He felt no pain, only the ache in his heart. Choose me. There were tears on his cheeks, even as he felt the shame of it. She was no one, a girl who had lucked into a gift, who had done nothing to earn it. She was his queen. Darlington, she said but that was not his true name any more than Alex was hers. If only she would choose him. If only she would let him. She touched her fingers to his face, lifted his chin. Her lips brushed his ear. He didn't understand it. He only wanted her to do it again. Stars poured through him, a cold and billowing wave of night. He saw everything. He saw their bodies entwined. She was above him and beneath him all at once, her body splayed and white as a lotus flower. She bit his ear, hard. Darlington yelped and flinched back, sense flooding through him. Darlington, she snarled. Get your shit together. And then he saw himself. He'd hiked up her skirt. His hands were braced on her white thighs. He saw the masked faces around them 
sensed their eagerness as they leaned forward, eyes glittering. Alex was looking down at him, gripping his shoulders, trying to shove him away. The cavern was gone. They were in the banquet room. He fell backward, letting her skirt drop, his erection throbbing valiantly in his jeans before humiliation washed over him. What the hell had they done to him? And how? The mist, he said, feeling like the worst kind of fool, his mind still spinning, his body buzzing with whatever he had inhaled. He'd walked straight through the blast of that fog machine and hadn't thought twice about it. Lonsiha grinned. You can't blame a god for trying. Darlington used the wall to push to his feet, keeping clear of the mirror. He could still feel its hum vibrating through him. He wanted to rage at these people. Interfering with representatives of Lethe was strictly prohibited, a violation of every code of the societies, but he also just wanted to get clear of manuscript before he humiliated himself further. Everywhere he looked he saw masked and painted faces. Come on, said Alex, taking his arm and leading him up the stairs, forcing him to walk ahead of her. He knew they should stay. See the night past the witching hour, make sure nothing got past the forbidden floors or interfered with the culling. He couldn't. He needed to get free. Now. The stairs seemed to go on forever, turning and turning until Darlington had no idea how long they'd been climbing. He wanted to look back to make sure that Alex was still there, but he'd read enough stories to know you never looked back on your way out of hell. The upper floor of manuscript felt like a wild blaze of color and light. He could smell the fruit fermenting in the punch, the yeasty tang of sweat. The air felt sticky and warm against his skin. Alex shook his arm and pulled him along by his elbow. All he could do was stumble after. They burst into the cold night air as if they'd slid through a membrane. Darlington inhaled deeply, feeling his head clear a little. He heard voices and realized Alex was talking to Mike Awalowo, the manuscript delegation president. Kate Masters was beside him. She was covered in flowering vines. They were going to consume her, no. She was just dressed as poison ivy, for God's sake. Unacceptable, Darlington said. His lips felt fuzzy. Alex kept one hand on his arm. I'll handle it. Stay here. They'd made it down the street to the hutch. Darlington leaned his head against the Mercedes. He should pay attention to what Alex was saying to Kate and Mike, but the metal felt cool and forgiving against his face. Moments later they were getting into his car and he was mumbling the address for Black Elm. Mike and Kate peered through the passenger window as the car drove off. They're afraid you're going to report them, Alex said. Damn right I will. They're going to eat a huge fine. A suspension. I told him I'd handle the write-up. You will not. You can't be objective about this. No, he couldn't. In his head, he was kneeling again, face pressed to her thighs, desperate to get closer. The thought of it made him instantly hard again, and he was grateful for the dark. What do you want me to say in the report? Alex asked. All of it, Darlington muttered miserably. It isn't a big deal, she said. It had been a big deal, though. He had felt. Desire wasn't even the right word for it. He could still feel her skin under his palms, the heat of her against his lips through the thin fabric of her panties. What the hell was wrong with him? I'm sorry, he said. That was unforgivable. You got wasted and acted a fool at a party. Relax. If you don't want to continue working with me. Shut up, Darlington, Alex said. I'm not doing this job without you. She got him back to Black Elm and put him to bed. The house was ice. Cold and he realized his teeth were chattering. Alex lay down beside him with the covers pulled tight between them and his heart hurt for the wanting of someone. Mike said the drug should be out of your system in about twelve hours. Darlington lay in his narrow bed, 
writing and rewriting angry emails in his head to the manuscript alumni and the Lethe board, losing the thread, overwhelmed by images of Alex lit by stars, the thought of that black dress sliding from her shoulders, then returning to his rant and a demand for action. The words tangled together, caught on the spokes of a wheel, the points of a crown. But one thought returned again and again as he tossed and turned, fell in and out of dreams, morning light beginning its slow bleed through the high tower window. Alex Stern was not what she seemed. 11. Winter. Alex woke abruptly. She was asleep and then she was conscious and terrified, batting at the hands she could still feel around her neck. Her throat felt raw and red. She was on the couch of the common room, at the hutch. Night had fallen and the lights burned low in their sconces, casting yellow half-moons against framed paintings of rolling meadows dotted with sheep and shepherds playing their pipes. Here, Dawes said, perching on the cushions, holding a glass full of what looked like eggnog with a little green food coloring in it up to Alex's lips. A musty smell emanated from the rim. Alex recoiled and opened her mouth to ask what it was, but all that emerged was a faint rasp that made her throat feel like someone had touched a lit match to it. I'll tell you after you drink it, said Dawes. Trust me. Alex shook her head. The last thing Dawes had given her to drink had set her insides on fire. You're alive, aren't you? Dawes asked. Yes, but right now she wished she were dead. Alex pinched her nose, took the glass, and gulped. The taste was stale and powdery, the liquid so thick it almost choked her going down, but as soon as it touched her throat, the burning eased, leaving only a faint ache. She handed the glass back and wiped a hand over her mouth, shuddering slightly at the aftertaste. Goat's milk and mustard seed thickened with spider eggs, Dawes said. Alex pressed her knuckles to her lips and tried not to gag. Trust you? Her throat was sore, but she could at least talk and the raging fire inside her seemed to have banked. I had to use brimstone to burn the beetles out of you. I'd say the cure was worse than the disease, but given that those things eat you from the inside out, I think that would be lying. They were used to clean corpses in ancient times, to empty bodies so that they could be stuffed with fragrant herbs. That crawling sensation returned and Alex had to clench her fists to keep from scratching at her skin. What did they do to me? Will there be lasting damage? Dawes rubbed her thumb against the glass. I honestly don't know. Alex pushed up from the pillows that Dawes had placed beneath her neck. She likes taking care of people, Alex realized. Was that why she and Dawes had never gotten along? Because Alex had refused her mothering? How did you know what to do? Dawes frowned. It's my job to know. And Dawes was good at her job. Simple as that. She seemed calm enough, but if she gripped that glass any harder it was going to break in her hands. Her fingers were stained with rainbow splotches that Alex realized were the pale remnants of highlighter. Did anything try to get in? Alex wasn't even sure what that would look like. I'm not sure. The chimes have been ringing off and on. Something's been brushing up against the wards. Alex rose and felt the room spin. She stumbled and made herself take Dawes's solicitous hand. Alex wasn't sure what she expected to see waiting outside. The gloom's face looking back at her, light glinting off its glasses? Something worse? She touched her fingers to her throat and yanked the curtain back. The street to the left was dark and empty. She must have slept through the entire day. In the alley she saw the bridegroom, pacing back and forth in the yellow light of the street lamp. What is it? asked Dawes nervously. What's there? She sounded almost breathless. Just a gray. The bridegroom. He looked up at the window. Alex drew the curtain closed. You can really see him? I've only seen photos. Alex nodded. He's very tousled. Very mournful. Very. 
Morrissey. Dawes surprised her by singing, and I wonder, does anybody feel the same way I do? And is evil, sang Alex quietly, just something you are or something you do? She'd meant it as a joke, a way to solidify the bare threads of camaraderie forming between them, but in the eerie lamplit quiet, the words sounded menacing. I think he saved my life. He attacked that thing. The Gluma? Yeah. Alex shuddered. It had been so strong and seemingly immune to everything she'd thrown at it, which admittedly hadn't been much. I need to know how to stop one of those things. I'll pull whatever we have on them, said Dawes. But you shouldn't form ties with Greys, especially a violent one. We don't have a tie. Then why did he help you? Maybe he wasn't helping me. Maybe he was trying to hurt the Gluma. I didn't exactly have time to ask. I'm just saying. I know what you're saying, said Alex, then flinched when a low gong sounded. Someone had entered the stairwell. It's okay, Dawes said. It's only Dean Sando. You called Sando? Of course, Dawes said, straightening. You were nearly killed. I'm fine. Because a gray interceded on your behalf. Don't tell him that, Alex snarled before she could tame her response. Dawes drew back. He needs to know what happened. Don't tell him anything. Alex wasn't sure why she was so afraid of Sando, knowing what had gone down. Maybe it was just old habit. You didn't talk. You didn't tell. That was how CPS got called. That was how you got locked up for observation. Dawes planted her hands on her hips. What would I tell him? I don't know what happened to you any more than I know what happened to Darlington. I'm just here to clean up your messes. Isn't that what they pay you for? Empty the fridge. A little light dusting. Save my worthless life. Damn it. Dawes. But Sando was already pushing open the door. He startled when he saw Alex by the window. You're up. Dawes said you were unconscious. Alex wondered what else Dawes had said. She took good care of me. Excellent, Sando said, draping his overcoat on a bronze post shaped. Like a jackal's head and striding across the room to where the old-fashioned samovar sat in a corner. Sando had been a lethe delegate in the late seventies and a very good one, according to Darlington. Brilliant on theory, but just as good on fieldwork. He fashioned some original rites that are still on the books today. Sando had returned to campus as an associate professor ten years later, and since then he had served as Lethe's liaison with the university president. Excluding a few alums who had been taps themselves, the rest of the administration and faculty knew nothing about Lethe or the society's true activities. Alex could imagine Sando happily working away in the Lethe library or fastidiously marking a chalk circle. He was a small, tidy man with the trim build of a jogger and silvery brows that steepled at the center of his forehead, giving him a permanent look of concern. She'd seen little of him since she'd begun her education at Lethe. He'd sent her his contact information and an open invitation to office hours that she'd never taken him up on. Sometime in late September, he'd come to a long, awkward lunch at I.L. Bastone, during which he and Darlington discussed a new book on women and manufacturing in New Haven and Alex hid her white asparagus beneath a bread roll. And, of course, he was the one Alex texted the night Darlington disappeared. Sando had come to I.L. Bastone that night with his old yellow Labrador, Honey. He made a fire in the parlor grate and asked Dawes for tea and brandy as Alex tried to explain, not what had happened. She didn't know what had happened. She only knew what she'd seen. She was shaking by the time she finished, remembering the cold of the basement, the crackling smell of electricity on the air. Sando had patted her knee gently and set a steaming mug before her. Drink, he'd said. It will help. That must have been very frightening. The words took Alex by surprise. 
her life had been a series of terrifying things she'd been expected to take in stride. It sounds like portal magic. Someone playing with something they shouldn't. But he said it wasn't a portal. He said. He was scared, Alex, Sando had said gently. Probably panicked. For Darlington to disappear that way, a portal must have been involved. It may have been a kind of anomaly created by the Nexus, beneath Rosenfeld Hall. Dawes had drifted into the room, hovering behind the couch with her arms crossed tight, barely holding herself together while Sando murmured about retrieval spells and the likelihood that Darlington simply had to be pulled back from wherever he'd gone. We'll need a new moon night, Sando had said. And then we'll just call our boy home. Dawes burst out crying. Is he, where is he? Alex had asked. Is he suffering? Is he scared? I don't know, said the dean. That will be part of the challenge for us. He'd sounded almost eager, as if presented with a delicious problem. A portal of the size and shape you described, stable enough to be maintained without practitioners present, can't have gone anywhere interesting. Darlington was probably transported to a pocket realm. It's like dropping a coin between the cushions of a couch. But he's trapped there. He probably isn't even aware he's gone. Darlington will come back to us thinking he was just in Rosenfeld and furious that he'll have to repeat the semester. There had been emails and text chains since then, Sando's updates on who and what would be needed for the right, the creation of the Spain cover story, a flurry of apologetic and frustrated messages when the January new moon had to be scrapped due to Michelle Alamedin's schedule, followed by profound silence from Dawes. But that night, the night when Darlington had gone from the world, was the last time they'd all been in a room together. Sando was the fire alarm they weren't supposed to pull without good cause. Alex was tempted to think of him as the nuclear option, but really, he was just a parent. A proper adult. Now the dean stirred sugar into his cup. I appreciate your quick thinking, Pamela. We can't afford another, he trailed off. We just need to see the year out and, again he let his sentence dissolve as if he dunked it into his tea. And what? Alex nudged. Because she really did wonder what was supposed to come next. Dawes was standing with her hands clasped as if about to sing a choir solo, waiting, waiting. I've been thinking about that, said Sando at last. He sank down into a wing-backed chair. We're ready for the new moon. I'll pick up Michelle Alamedin from the train station Wednesday night and bring her directly to Black Elm. I have every hope that the right will work and that Darlington will be back with us soon. But we also need to be prepared for the alternative. The alternative, said Dawes. She sat down abruptly. Her face was tight, angry even. Alex remembered the gloom's furious grip as it had dragged her into the street but there was no gloom on the screen. Instead, she saw the dark-haired girl throw herself into the flow of cars, stumbling and wild, screaming and clawing at nothing. Then she was on her back. Alex's memory said the gloom was on top of her, but the screen showed nothing at all, just her lying at the center of the street as cars swerved to avoid her, her back bowing and flexing, her mouth wide, her hands clawing at nothing, convulsing. A moment later she was on her feet, lurching toward the alley that ran behind the hutch. She saw herself look back once, eyes wide, face streaked with blood, mouth open in horror, the corners pulled down like the corners of a sail pulled taut. I was seeing the bridegroom fight the gloomer. Or was I? It was the face of a madwoman. She was back on that bathroom floor, shorts around her ankles, screaming and alone. Alex, everything you say may be true. But there is no proof of what attacked you, let alone who might be responsible. If I show this to the alumni, it's essential that they see you as stable, reliable, particularly given, well, given how precarious things are now. Given that Darlington had disappeared. Given that it had happened when she was supposed to be watching his back. 
isn't this why we're here? asked Alex, a last try, an appeal on behalf of something bigger than herself, something Sando might value more. To protect girls, like Tara? To make sure the societies don't just do whatever they want? Absolutely. But do you really believe you're equipped to investigate a homicide by yourself? There's a reason I told you to stand down. I'm trying to keep things as normal as they can be in a world where monsters live. The police are investigating the Hutchins murder. The girl's boyfriend has been arrested and is awaiting trial. Do you honestly think that if Turner found a connection to one of the societies, he wouldn't pursue it? No, admitted Alex. I know he would. Whatever she thought of him, Turner was a bloodhound with a conscience that never took the day off. If he does, we will absolutely be there to lend him support, and I promise to pass along everything you've learned. But right now I need you to focus on getting well and staying safe. Dawes and I will both put our minds to what might have triggered the Gluma attack, and if there may be other disruptions caused by your ability. Your presence here on campus is an unknown factor, a disruptor. The behavior of those greys during the prognostication, Darlington's disappearance, a violent death near campus, now a gluma. Wait, said Alex. You think my being here had something to do with Tara getting killed? Of course not, said the dean. But I don't want to give the Lethe board reasons to start drawing those kinds of conclusions. And I cannot afford to let you play amateur detective in a matter this serious. Our funding is up for review this year. We exist by the university's good graces, and we keep our lights on through the continued support of the other societies. We need their goodwill. He released a long breath. Alex, I don't mean to sound cold. The Hutchins murder is gruesome and tragic, and I am absolutely going to monitor this situation but we have to tread cautiously. The end of last semester. What happened at Rosenfeld changed everything. Pamela, do you want to see Lethe's funding pulled? No, Dawes whispered. If she spoke Sando's language, Sando was also fluent in Dawes. Lethe was her hiding place, her bunker. There was no way she was going to risk losing it. But Alex was only half paying attention to the dean's speech. She was staring at the old map of New Haven that hung above the mantel. It showed the original nine-square plan for the New Haven colony. She remembered what Darlington had said that first day as they crossed the green. The town was meant to be a new Eden, founded between two rivers like the Tigris and the Euphrates. Alex looked at the shape of the colony, a wedge of land bracketed by West River and the Farmington Canal two slender channels of water rushing to meet each other at the harbor. She finally understood why the crime scene had looked so familiar. The intersection where Tara Hutchins's body had been found looked just like the map. That slab of empty land in front of Baker Hall was like the colony in miniature. The streets that framed that plot of land were the rivers, flowing with traffic, joining at Tower Parkway. And Tara Hutchins had been found in the middle of it all as if her punctured body lay at the heart of a new Eden. Her body hadn't just been dumped there. It had been placed there deliberately. Honestly, Alex, Sando was saying, what possible motive could any of these people have for hurting a girl like that? She didn't really know. She just knew that they had. Then someone had found out Alex visited the morgue. Whoever it was thought Alex knew Tara's secrets, at least some of them, and that she had enough magic at her disposal to learn more. They'd decided to do something about it. Maybe they'd been trying to kill her, or maybe discrediting her was enough. And the bridegroom? Why had he chosen to help her? Was he part of this somehow? Alex, I want you to thrive here, said Sando. I want us to get through this difficult year, and I want all of our attention focused on the new moon, right? and bringing Darlington home. Let's get through this, and then take stock. Alex wanted that too. She needed Yale. She needed her place here. But the dean was wrong. Tara's death 
hadn't been the easy ugly thing that Sando wanted it to be. Someone from the societies was involved, and whoever it was wanted to silence her. I'm in danger, she wanted to say. Someone hurt me, and I don't think they're finished. Help me. But what good had that ever done? Somehow. Alex had thought this place was different, with all of its rules and rituals and Dean Sando watching over them. We are the shepherds. But they were children at play. Alex looked at Sando sipping his tea, one leg crossed over the other, light glinting off his shiny loafer as his knee bounced, and she understood that at some level he truly did not care what harm came to her. He might even be hoping for it. If Alex got hurt, if she vanished, she would take with her all the blame for what had happened to Darlington, and her short, disastrous tenure at Yale would be written off as an unfortunate mistake in judgment, an ambitious experiment gone wrong. He'd get his golden boy back at the new moon and make everything right. He wanted to be comfortable. And wasn't Alex the same? Dreaming of a peaceful summer and mint in her tea while Tara Hutchins lay cold in a drawer? Rest easy. She'd been ready to do just that. But someone had tried to hurt her. Alex felt something dark inside her uncoil. You're a flat beast, Hell Lai had once said to her. Got a little viper lurking in there, ready to strike. A rattler, probably. She'd said it with a grin, but she'd been right. All this winter weather and polite conversation had put the serpent to sleep, its heartbeat slowing as it grew lazy and still, like any cold-blooded thing. I want us to get through this too, said Alex, and she smiled for him, a cowed smile, an eager smile. His relief gusted through the room like a warm front, the kind that New Englanders welcome and that Angelinos no means wildfires. Good, Alex. Then we will. He rose and put on his coat, his striped scarf. I'll submit your report to the alumni, and I'll see you and Dawes Wednesday night at Black Elm. He gave her shoulder a squeeze. Just a few more days and everything will be back to normal. Not for Tara Hutchins, you ass. She smiled again. See you Wednesday. Pamela, I'll send you an email on refreshments. Nothing fancy. We're expecting two representatives from Aurelian along with Michelle. He gave Alex a wink. You're going to love Michelle Alameddin. She was. Darlington's Virgil. An absolute genius. Can't wait, said Alex, returning the dean's wave as he saw himself out. When the door shut, she said, Dawes, how tough is it to talk to the dead? Not difficult at all, if you're in book and snake. They're last on my list. I try not to ask for help from people who might want to kill me. Limits your options, Dawes muttered to the floor. Ah, Dawes, I like you bitchy. Dawes shifted uncomfortably and tugged at her murky gray sweatshirt. She closed the laptop. Thanks for backing me with the dean. And for saving my life. Dawes nodded at the carpet. So what are my other options if I need to talk to someone on the other side of the veil? The only one I can think of is Wolf's Head. The shapeshifters? Do not call them that. Not if you're looking for favors. Alex crossed to the window, pulled open the curtain. Is he still there? Dawes said from behind her. He's there. Alex, what are you doing? Once you let him in. You know the stories about him, what he did to that girl. Open the door, Alex. I know he saved my life, and he wants my attention. Relationships have been built on less. The rules of Lethe House were opaque and convoluted. Catholic, Darlington had said. Byzantine. Still, the big stuff wasn't tough to remember. Leave the dead to the dead. Turn your eyes to the living but Alex needed allies, and Dawes wasn't going to be enough. She knocked on the window. Below, on the street, the bridegroom looked up. His dark eyes met hers in the light from the street lamp. She did not look away. Twelve. 
Winter. Alex knew she couldn't go to Wolf's Head empty-handed. If she wanted their help, she had a stop to make it scroll and key first to retrieve a statue of Romulus and Remus. Wolf's Head had been badgering Lethe to orchestrate its return since it went missing during their Valentine's Day party the year before, when they'd opened their doors to other society members, as was tradition. Though Alex had since spotted the statue sitting on a shelf in the locksmith's tomb, with a plastic tiara slung over it, Darlington had refused to get involved. Lethe doesn't concern itself with petty squabbles, he'd said. These kinds of pranks are beneath us. But Alex needed a way into the temple room at the heart of the wolf's head tomb, and she knew exactly what their delegation president, Salome Nils, would demand in payment. Alex drank one of Darlington's disgusting protein shakes from the fridge. She was hungry, which Dawes claimed was a good sign, but her throat couldn't tolerate anything solid yet. She wasn't eager to leave the safety of the wards when she didn't know exactly what had happened to the Gluma, but she couldn't just sit still. Besides, whoever had sent the Gluma thought she was laid up somewhere being consumed by corpse beetles from the inside out. As for her public fit in the middle of Elm Street, at least there hadn't been too many witnesses, and aside from Jonas Reed, it was unically any of them knew her. If someone did, she'd probably be getting a call from a concerned therapist at the health center. Alex had known the bridegroom would be waiting as soon as she and Dawes stepped out into the alley. It was almost dawn and the streets were quiet. Her protector followed them all the way to Scroll and Key, where she found a harried locksmith writing a paper and convinced him to let her into the tomb to look for a scarf Darlington had left behind during the last rite they'd observed. Lethe was usually permitted entry to the tombs only on ritual nights and during sanctioned inspections. Gets chilly in Andalusia, she told him. The locksmith hovered in the doorway, eyes on his phone as Alex pretended to search. He swore when the bell beside the front door rang again. Thank you, Dawes. Alex nabbed the statue and shoved it into her satchel. She glanced at the round stone table where the delegation gathered to work their rights, or try to. A quote was carved into the table's edge, one she'd always liked, have power on this dark land to lighten it, and power on this dead world to make it live. Something about those words rang a bell, but she couldn't pry the memory loose. She heard the front door slam and hurried out of the room, thanking the locksmith, now muttering about drunk partiers who couldn't find their damn dorms, on her way out. There was a very good chance scroll and Key would point the finger at her once they noticed the statue was missing, but she would just have to deal with that later. Dawes was waiting around the corner by the gothic folly that served as an entrance to the base library. Darlington had told her that the stone swords carved into its decoration were signs of warding. This is a bad idea, Dawes said, bundled into her parka and radiating disapproval. At least I'm consistent. Dawes's head swiveled on her neck like a searchlight. Is he here? Alex knew she meant the bridegroom and though she would never admit it, she was unnerved by how easy it had been to secure his attention. She doubted it would be that easy to shake it. She glanced over her shoulder, where he trailed them by what could only be called a respectful distance. Half a block away. He's a murderer, Dawes whispered. Well, then we have something in common, thought Alex. But all she said was, beggars can't be choosers. She didn't like the idea of letting a grey get close to her, but she'd made her choice and she wasn't going to rethink it now. If someone from the societies was responsible for slapping a target on her back, she was going to find out who, and then she was going to make sure they didn't have a chance to hurt her again. Even so, Dawes, she murmured. When we get back, let's start looking for ways to break the link between people and greys. I don't want to spend the rest of my life with Morrissey peering over my shoulder. The easiest way is not to form a bond to begin with. Really, said Alex. Let me write that down. The wolf's head tomb was only a few doors away from the hutch, a grand gray manor house, 
fronted by a scrubby garden and surrounded by a high stone wall. It was one of the most magical places on campus. The alley that horseshoed around it was bordered by old fraternity houses, sturdy brick structures long ago ceded to the university, ancient symbols of channeling carved into the stone above their doorways beside unremarkable clusters of Greek letters. The alley acted as a kind of moat where power gathered in a thick, crackling haze. Passing through, most people rode off the shiver that seized them to a shift in weather or a bad mood, then forgot as soon as they had moved on to the Yale Cabaret or the AFAM Center. Wolf's Heads members took great pride in the fact that they'd housed protesters during the Black Panther trials, but they'd also been the last of the ancient eight to let in women, so Alex considered it a wash. On ritual nights, she regularly saw a gray standing in the courtyard, mooning the offices of the Yale Daily News next door. Alex had to ring the bell at the gate twice before Salome Nils finally answered and let them inside. Who's this? Salome asked. For a second, Alex thought she could see the bridegroom. He had drawn closer, matching Alex step for step, a small smile corking his lips, as if he could hear the hummingbird beat of her heart. Then she realized Salome was talking about Dawes. Most people in the societies probably had no idea Pamela Dawes even existed. She's assisting me, said Alex. But Salome was already leading them into the dark foyer. The bridegroom followed. The tombs were kept unwarded to allow the easy flow of magic, but that meant greys could come and go as they pleased. It was what made Lethe's protection necessary during rites. Do you have it? Salome asked. The interior was nondescript, slate floors, dark wood, leaded windows overlooking a small interior courtyard. Where an ash tree grew. It had been there long before the university and would probably still be stretching its roots when the stones around it crumbled to dust. A magnetic board by the door showed which delegation members were currently at the tomb, a necessity given the size of the place. They were listed by their Egyptian god names, and only Salami's Ankh, labeled Shefrin, had been moved to the at home column. Got it, said Alex, pulling the statue from her bag. Salome seized it with a happy shriek. Perfect. He's is going to be so pissed when they realize we got it back. What does it do? Alex asked as Salome led them back into another dark room, this one with an elongated lozenge of a table at its center, surrounded by low chairs. The walls were lined with glass cases full of Egyptian curios and depictions of wolves. It doesn't do anything, Salome said with a withering look. She set the statue back in the case. It's the principle of the thing. We invited them into our house and they shat on our hospitality. Right, said Alex. That's awful. But she felt that angry rattle inside her twitch, vibrating against her sternum. Someone had just tried to kill her and this princess was playing stupid games. Let's get this started. Salome shifted her weight. Listen, I really can't open up the temple without approval from the delegation. Not even alumni are allowed in. Dawes released a small humming sigh. She was clearly relieved at the prospect of turning right around to go home. That wasn't going to happen. We had a deal. Are you actually trying to run game on me? Alex asked. Salome grinned. She didn't feel the least bit bad about it. And why would she? Alex was a freshman, an apprentice, clearly out of her element. She'd been nothing but quiet and deferential around Salome and the Wolf's Head delegation, always letting Darlington, the real presence, the gentleman of Lethe, do the talking. Maybe if Lethe had rescued her from her life sooner, she could have been that girl. Maybe if the Gluma hadn't attacked and Dean Sando hadn't ignored her she could have kept pretending to be her. I got your stupid figurine, said Alex. You owe me. Except you weren't really supposed to do that, were you? So. Most drug deals were done on credit. You got your supply from someone with the real connections, 
you proved you could move it for a good price. Maybe next time you got the chance at a bigger bite. You know why your boy is amateur and will stay amateur? Aton had asked Alex in his heavy accent once. He'd hiked a thumb at Lynn, who was giggling over a bong while Betcha played Halo beside him. He's too busy smoking my product to make anyone but me rich. Lynn was always scraping by, always coming up a little short. When Alex was fifteen she'd come back to Len without his money, confused and flustered by the investment banker she'd met in the parking lot of the Sherman Oaks Sports Authority. Len usually handled him, leaving sweet-faced Alex to do runs at the colleges and malls. But Len had been too hungover that morning, so he'd given her bus fare and she'd ridden the RTD down to Ventura Boulevard. Alex didn't know what to say when the banker told her he was short on cash, that he didn't have the money right then, but he was good for it. She'd never had someone flat out refuse to pay. The college kids she dealt with called her little sis, and sometimes they even invited her to smoke up with them. Alex had expected Len to be pissed, but he'd been furious in a way she'd never seen before, frightened, screaming it was on her and she was going to have to answer to Aton. So she'd found a way to pay back the money. She'd gone home for the weekend and stolen her grandmother's garnet earrings to hawk, had gotten a shift at Club Joy, the worst of the strip clubs, full of losers who barely tipped and owned by a tiny guy called King King, who wouldn't let you out of the dressing room without copping a feel first. It was the only place willing to take her on with no ID and nothing to fill her bikini. Some guys like that, King King had said before shoving his hand in her top. But not me. She'd never come back short again. Now she looked at Salome Nils, lean and smooth-faced, a Connecticut girl who rode horses and played tennis, her heavy bronze ponytail tucked over one shoulder like an expensive pelt. Salome, how about you rethink your position? How about you and your spinster aunt run home? Salome was taller than Alex, so Alex grabbed her by the lower lip, hard, and yanked. The girl squeaked and bent at the waist, flailing her arms. Alex. Dawes yelped, hands pressed to her chest like a woman pretending to be a corpse. Alex wrapped her arm around Salami's neck, looping her into a chokehold, a grip she'd learned from Minky, who was only four foot five and the one girl at Club Joy who King King never messed with. Alex fastened her fingers around the pear-shaped diamond drop that hung from Salami's ear. She was aware of Dawes's shocked presence, of the bridegroom stepping forward as if chivalry demanded he do so, the way the very air around them was shifting, changing, the haze dissipating so that Salome and Dawes and maybe even the Grey could see her clearly for the first time. Alex knew it was probably a mistake. Better not to be noticed, to keep your head down, remain the quiet girl, in over her head, but no threat to anyone. But, like most mistakes, it felt good. I really like these earrings, she said softly. How much did they cost? Alex. Dawes protested again. Salome scrabbled at Alex's forearm. She was strong from sports like squash and sailing, but she'd never had anyone lay hands on her probably never seen a fight outside of a movie theater. You don't know, right? They were a present from your dad on your sweet sixteen or on graduation or some shit like that. Alex jostled her and Salome squeaked again. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to let me into that room or I'm going to tear these things out of your ears and shove them both down your throat and you can choke on them. It was an empty threat. Alex wasn't in the business of wasting a nice pair of diamonds. But Salome didn't know that. She started crying. Better, Alex. Said. We understand each other? Salome gave a frantic nod of her head, the sweaty skin of her throat bobbing against Alex's arm. Alex released her. Salome backed away, hands held out in front of her. Dawes had pressed her fingers to her mouth and even the bridegroom looked disturbed. She'd managed to scandalize a murderer. You're insane, said Salome, touching her fingertips to her throat. You can't just. 
the snake inside Alex stopped twitching and uncoiled. She curled her hand into the sleeve of her coat and slammed it through the glass case where they kept their little trinkets. Salome and Dawes shrieked. They both took another step back. I know you're used to dealing with people who can't just, but I can, so give me the key to the temple room and let's get square so we can forget all about this. Salome hovered, poised on the tips of her toes, framed by the doorway. She looked so light, so impossibly slender, as if she might simply lose contact with the ground and float up to the ceiling to bob there like a party balloon. Then something shifted in her eyes, all of that Puritan pragmatism seeping back into her bones. She settled on her heels. Whatever, she muttered, and fished her keys from her pocket, slipping one from the ring and setting it on the table. Thank you. Alex winked. Now we can be friends again. Psycho. So I hear, said Alex. But Crazy survived. Alex snatched up the key. After you, Dawes. Dawes passed through to the hallway, keeping a wide distance between herself and Alex, eyes on the floor. Alex turned back to Salome. I know you're thinking that as soon as I'm in the temple you're going to start making calls, try to get me jammed up. Salome folded her arms. I think you should do that. Then I'll come back and use that wolf statue to knock your front teeth in. The bridegroom shook his head. You can't just. Salome, Alex said, shaking her finger. Those words again. But Salome clenched her fists. You can't just do things like that. You'll go to jail. Probably, said Alex. But you'll still look like a brother fucking hillbilly. What is wrong with you? Dawes spat as Alex joined her at the nondescript door that led to the temple room, the bridegroom trailing behind. I'm a bad dancer and I don't floss. What's wrong with you? Now that the wave of adrenaline had passed, remorse was setting in. Once a mask was off you couldn't just slide it back into place. Salome wouldn't be calling the cavalry, Alex felt pretty sure of that. But she felt equally certain that the girl would talk. Psycho. Crazy bitch. Whether she would be. Belief was another thing entirely. Salome had said it herself, you can't just. People here didn't behave the way that Alex had. The more pressing concern was how good Alex felt, like she was breathing easy for the first time in months, free from the suffocating weight of the new Alex she'd tried to construct. But Dawes was breathing hard as if she'd done all the work. Alex flipped a light switch and flames flared to life in the gas lanterns along the red and gold walls, illuminating an Egyptian temple built into the heart of the English manor house. An altar was laden with skulls, taxidermied animals, and a leather ledger signed by each of the delegation's members before the start of a ritual. At the center of the back wall was a sarcophagus topped with glass, a desiccated mummy pilfered from a Nile Valley dig inside. It was all almost too expected. The ceiling was painted to look like a vaulted sky, acanthus leaves and stylized palms at the corners, and a stream cut through the center of the room, fed by a sheet of water that toppled from the edge of the balcony above, the echo overwhelming. The bridegroom drifted across the stream, as far from the sarcophagus as he could get. I'm leaving. Salome shouted from down the hall. I don't want to be here if something goes wrong. Nothing's going to go wrong. Alex called back. They heard the front door slam. Dawes, what did she mean if something goes wrong? Did you read the ritual? Dawes asked as she walked the perimeter of the room, studying its details. Parts of it. Enough to know it could put her in touch with the bridegroom. You have to cross into the borderland between life and death. Wait. I'm going to have to die. She really should start doing the reading. Yes. And come back? I mean, that's the idea. And you're going to have to kill me? Timid Dawes who, at the first sign of violence, 
had curled into a corner like a hedgehog in a sweatshirt. You okay with that? It's not going to look good for you if I don't make it back. Dawes expelled a long breath. So make it back. The bridegroom's face was bleak, but that was sort of his look. Alex contemplated the altar. So the afterlife is Egypt? Of all the religions, the ancient Egyptians got it right? We don't really know what the afterlife is like. This is one way into one borderland. There are others. They're always marked by rivers. Like Lethe to the Greeks. Actually, to the Greeks, Styx is the border river. Lethe is the final boundary the dead must cross. The Egyptians believed the sun died on the western banks of the Nile every day, so to journey from its eastern bank to the west is to leave the world of the living behind. And that was the journey Alex would have to make. The river bisecting the temple was symbolic, hewn of stone mined from the ancient limestone tunnels beneath Tura, hieroglyphs from the book of emerging forth into night carved into the sides and base of the channel. Alex hesitated. Was this the crossroads? Was this the last foolish thing she would do? And who would be there to greet her in the beyond? Hell I. Maybe Darlington. Lynn and Betya, their skulls crushed in, that cartoonish look of surprise still stuck on Lynn's face. Or maybe they'd be made whole somewhere on that other shore. If she died, would she be able to cross back through the veil and spend an eternity flitting around campus? Would she end up back home, doomed to haunt some dump in Van Nuys? So make it back. Make it back or leave Dawes holding her dead body and Salome Nils to share the blame. The last thought wasn't entirely unpleasant. All I have to do is drown. That's all, said Dawes without a hint of a smile. Alex unbuttoned her coat and drew off her sweater, while Dawes shed her parka, drawing two slender green reeds from her pockets. Where is he? she whispered. The bridegroom? Right behind you. Dawes flinched. Kidding. He's by the altar, doing his brooding thing. The bridegroom's scowl deepened. Have him stand opposite you on the western shore. He can hear you fine, Dawes. Oh, yes, of course. Dawes made an awkward gesture, and the bridegroom drifted to the other side of the stream. It was narrow enough that. He crossed it with a single long step. Now you both kneel. Alex wasn't sure if the bridegroom would be so quick to follow instructions, but he did. They knelt. He seemed to want this little talk as much as Alex did. She could feel the cold of the floor through her jeans. She realized she was wearing a white t-shirt and it was going to get soaked. You're about to die, she scolded herself. Maybe now isn't the time to worry about giving a ghost a look at your boobs. Put your hands behind your back, said Dawes. Why? Dawes held up the reeds and recited, Let his wrists be bound with stalks of papyrus. Alex put her hands behind her back. It was like getting arrested. She half expected Dawes to slide a zip tie around her wrists. Instead, she felt Dawes drop something into her left pocket. It's a carob pod. When you want to come back, put it in your mouth and bite down. Ready? Go slow, said Alex. Alex bent forward. It was awkward with her hands behind her back. Dawes braced her head and neck and helped her fall forward. Alex hovered for a moment above the surface, raised her eyes, met the bridegroom's gaze. Do it, she said. She took a deep breath and tried not to panic as Dawes shoved her head underwater. Silence filled her ears. She opened her eyes but could see nothing but black stone. She waited, breath leaking from her in reluctant bubbles as her chest tightened. Her lungs ached. She couldn't do this, not this way. They'd have to come up with something else. She tried to push up but Dawes's fingers were claws on the back of Alex's skull. It was impossible to break her grip in this position. Dawes's knee pressed into her back. 
her fingers felt like spikes digging into Alex's scalp. The pressure in Alex's chest was unbearable. Panic came at her like a dog, slipped free of its leash, and she knew she'd made a very bad mistake. Dawes had been working with Book and Snake. Or Skull and Bones. Or Sando. Or whoever wanted her gone. Dawes was finishing what the Gluma had started. Dawes was punishing her for what had happened to Darlington. She'd known the truth of what had gone down that night at Rosenfeld all along, and this was her revenge on Alex for stealing away her golden boy. Alex bucked and thrashed in silence. She had to breathe. Don't. But her body wouldn't listen. Her mouth opened on a gasp. Water rushed into her nose, her mouth filled her lungs. Her mind was screaming in terror, but there was no way out. She thought of her mother, the silver bangles stacked on her forearms like gauntlets. Her grandmother whispered, Somos almacas sin picado. Her gnarled hands gripped the skin of a pomegranate, spilling the seeds into a bowl. We are little souls without sin. Then the pressure on the back of her neck was gone. Alex hurled herself backward, chest heaving. A rush of gritty water spewed from her mouth as her body convulsed. She realized her wrists were free and pushed up to her hands and knees. Deep, rattling coughs shook her body. Her lungs burned as she gulped at the air. Screw Dawes. Screw everyone. She was sobbing, unable to stop. Her arms gave way and she fell to the floor, flopped onto her back, sucking in breath, and wiped a wet sleeve over her face, trailing snot and tears, and blood. She'd bitten her tongue. She squinted up at the painted ceiling. There were clouds moving across it, gray against the indigo sky. Stars glinted above her in strange formations. They were not her constellations. Alex forced herself to sit up. She touched her hand to her chest, rubbing it gently, still coughing, trying to get her bearings. Dawes was gone. Everything was gone, the walls, the altar, the stone floors. She sat on the banks of a great river that flowed black beneath the stars, the sound of the water a long exhalation. A warm wind moved through the reeds. Death is cold, thought Alex. Shouldn't it be cold here? Far across the water, she could see a man's shape moving toward her from the opposite shore. The water parted around the bridegroom's body. So he had true physical form here. Had she stepped behind the veil, then? Was she truly dead? Despite the balmy air, Alex felt a chill creep through her as the figure drew closer. He had no reason to harm her, he'd saved her. But he's a killer, she reminded herself. Maybe he just misses murdering women. Alex didn't want to go back into the water, not when her chest still rattled with the memory of that violent pressure and her throat was raw. From coughing. But she had come here with a purpose. She rose, scrubbed the sand from her palms, and waded into the shallows, her boots squelching in the mud. The river rose, warm against her calves, the current pulling gently at her knees, then her thighs, then her waist. She drifted past the spiky bowls of lotus flowers resting gently on the surface, still as a table setting. The water tugged at her hips, the current strong. She could feel the silt shift beneath her feet. Something brushed against her in the water and she glimpsed starlight glinting off a shiny, ridged back. She flinched backward as the crocodile passed, a single golden eye rolling toward her as it submerged. To her left, another black tail flicked through the water. They cannot harm you. The bridegroom stood only a few yards away. But you must come to me, Miss Stern. To the center of the river. Where the dead and the living might meet. She didn't like that he knew her name. His voice was low and pleasant, the accent almost English but broader in the vowels, a little like someone imitating a Kennedy. Alex waited in farther, until she stood directly in front of the bridegroom. He looked just as he had in the living world, 
silver light clinging to the sharp lines of his elegant face, caught in his dark must hair, except here she was close enough to see the creases of the knot in his necktie, the sheen of his coat. The bits of bone and gore that had splattered the white fabric of his shirt were gone. He was clean here, free of blood or wound. A boat slid past, a slim craft topped by a pavilion of billowing silks. Shadows moved behind the fabric, dim shapes that were men one moment and jackals the next. A great cat lay at the edge of the boat, its paw playing with the water. It looked at her with huge diamond eyes, then yawned, revealing a long pink tongue. Where are we? she asked the bridegroom. At the center of the river, the place of Mayat, divine order. In Egypt all gods are the gods of death and life as well. We don't have much time, Miss Stern. Unless you wish to join us here permanently. The current is strong, and inevitably we all succumb. Alex looked over his shoulder to the shore beyond, west to the setting sun, to the dark lands, and the next world. Not yet. I need you to look for someone on the other side of the veil, she said. The murdered girl. That's right. Her name is Tara Hutchins. No small feat this is a crowded place. But I'm betting you're up to the task. And I'm guessing that you want something in return. That's why you came to my rescue, isn't it? The bridegroom didn't answer. His face remained very still, as if waiting for an audience to quiet. In the starlight, his eyes looked almost purple. If I'm to find the girl, I'll need something personal of hers, a beloved possession. Preferably something that retains her effluvia. Her what? Saliva, blood, perspiration. I'll get it. Alex said, though she had no idea how she was going to manage that. No chance was she going to be able to talk her way back into the morgue, and she was all out of coins of compulsion. Besides, Tara might be underground or ashes by now, for all she knew. You'll need to bring it to the borderlands. I doubt I can come back here. Salome and I aren't exactly on friendly terms. I can't imagine why. The bridegroom's lips pursed slightly, and in that moment, he reminded her so much of Darlington, she felt a tremor pass through her. On the western shore, she could see dark shapes moving, some human, some less so. A murmur rose from them, but she couldn't tell if there was reason in the noise, if it was language or just sounds. I need to know who murdered Tara, she said. A name. And if she doesn't know her attacker? Then find out what she was doing with Trip Helmuth. He's in skull and bones. And if she knew anyone in Book and Snake. I need to know how she's connected to the societies. If she was connected at all, if it wasn't just coincidence. Find out why the hell, a bolt of lightning flashed overhead. Thunder cracked and the river suddenly seemed alive with restless reptilian bodies. The bridegroom raised a brow. They don't like that word here. Who? Alex wanted to ask. The dead? The gods? Alex dug her boots into the sand as the current tugged at her knees, urging her west into darkness. She could ponder the mechanics of the afterlife later. Just find out why someone wanted Tara dead. She has to know something. Then let us come to terms, said the bridegroom. You shall have your information, and in return I wish to know who murdered my fiancé. This is awkward. I was under the impression you did. The bridegroom's lips pursed again. He looked so prim, so put out, Alex almost laughed. I'm aware. Murder-suicide? Shot her, then yourself? I did not. Whoever killed her was responsible for my death as well. I don't know who it was. Just as Tara Hutchins may not know who harmed her. All right, Alex said dubiously. Then why not ask your fiancé what she saw? His eyes slid away. I can't find her. I've been searching for her on both sides of the veil for over a hundred and fifty years. Maybe she doesn't want to be found. He nodded stiffly. 
if a spirit doesn't wish to be found, there's an eternity to hide in. She blames you, Alex said, fitting the pieces together. Possibly. And you think she'll stop blaming you if you find out who really did this? Hopefully. Or you could just leave her be. I was responsible for Daisy's death, even if I didn't deal her the blow. I failed to protect her. I owe her justice. Justice? It's not like you can seek revenge. Whoever killed you is long since dead. Then I will find him on this side. And do what? Kill him real good? The bridegroom smiled then, the corners of his mouth pulling back to reveal an even, predatory set of teeth. Alex felt a chill settle over her. She remembered the way he'd looked wrestling with the gluma. Like something that wasn't quite human. Something even the dead should fear. There are worse things than death, Miss Stern. Again the murmuring rose from the banks of the western shore, and this time Alex thought she could pick out the sound of what might have been French. Jean Dumond? It might be a man's name, or just nonsense syllables her mind was trying to shape into meaning. You've had over a hundred years to try to find this mystery killer, Alex said. Why do you think I'm going to have any better luck? Your associate Daniel Arlington was looking into the case. I don't think so. An old murder that headlined haunted New England tours wasn't Darlington's style at all. He visited the place where we fell. He had a notebook with him. He took photos. I highly doubt he was just sightseeing. I can't get past the wards of the house on Orange Street. I want to know why he went there and what he found. And Darlington isn't, he isn't there? With you? Even the dead don't know where Daniel Arlington is. If the bridegroom hadn't found Darlington on the other side, then Sando had to be right. He was just missing, and that meant he could be found. Alex needed to believe that. Fine Tara, Alex said, eager to be out of the water and back to the world of the living. I'll see what work Darlington left behind. But I need to know something. Tell me you didn't send that thing, the Gluma, after me. Why would I? To form a connection between us. To make me indebted to you and lay the groundwork for this little partnership. I didn't send that thing after you and I don't know who did. How am I to convince you? Alex wasn't sure. She'd hoped she'd somehow be able to tell but there was some vow she could force him to make, but she supposed she'd know soon enough. Assuming she could figure out what Darlington had discovered, if anything. The factory that had been the murder site was a parking garage now. Knowing Darlington, he'd probably gone there to take notes on the history of New Haven concrete. Just find Tara, she said. Get me my answers, and I'll get yours. This is not the pact I would have chosen nor are you the partner I would have sought, but we will both make the best of it. You're quite the charmer. Daisy liked that way with words? The bridegroom's eyes turned black. Alex had to force herself not to take a step backward. Quick temper. Just the type of guy to off a lady who got sick of his shit. Did you? I loved her. I loved her more than life. That isn't an answer. He took a deep breath, summoning his composure, and his eyes returned to their normal state. He held out his hand to her. Speak your true name, Miss Stern, and let us make our bargain. There was power in names. It was why the names of Grays were blacked from the pages of Lethe's records. It was why she would rather think of the thing before her as the bridegroom. The danger lay in connection in the moment when you bound your life to someone else's. Alex fingered the carob pod in her pocket. Best to be ready in case, what? He tried to drag her under? But why would he? He needed her, and she needed him. That was how most disasters began. She took his hand in hers. His grip was firm, his palm damp and ice cold against hers. What was she touching? A body? A thought? Bertram Boyce North, 
he said. That's a terrible name. It's a family name, he said indignantly. Galaxy Stern, she said, but when she tried to pull her hand back, his fingers closed tighter. I have waited a long time for this moment. Alex popped the care of pot into her mouth. Moments pass, she said, letting it rest between her teeth. You thought me sleeping, but I heard you say, I heard you say, that you were no true wife. Again, Alex tried to pull away. His hand stayed closed hard around hers. I swear I will not ask your meaning in it. I do believe yourself against yourself, and will henceforward rather die than doubt. Rather die than doubt. Tara's Tattoo The quote wasn't from some metal band. Idols of the King, she said. You remember now. She'd had to read the whole long sprawl of Tennyson's poem as part of the preparation for Darlington's and her first visit to Scroll and Key. There were quotes from it all over their tomb, tributes to King Arthur and his knights, and a vault full of treasures plundered during the Crusades. Have power on this dark land to lighten it, and power on this dead world to make it live. She remembered the words etched into the stone table at the locksmith's tomb. Alex shook free of the bridegroom's grip. So Tara's death was potentially connected to three societies. Tara was tied to skull and bones through Trip Helmuth, to Book and Snake by the Gluma attack, and, unless Tara had a secret taste for Victorian poetry, she was linked to Scroll and Key by her Tennyson tattoo. North bowed slightly. When you find something that belonged to Tara, bring it to any body of water and I will come to you. They are all crossing places for us now. Alex flexed her fingers, wanting to be free of the feel of the bridegroom's hand in hers. I'll do that. She turned from him, biting down on the carob pod, her mouth flooding with a bitter, chalky taste. She tried to push toward the eastern bank, but the river yanked at her knees and she stumbled. She felt herself pulled backward as she lost her footing, her boots seeking purchase on the riverbed as she was dragged toward the host of dark shapes on the western shore. North had his back to her and he already seemed impossibly far away. The shapes did not look quite human anymore. They were too tall, too lean, their arms long and bent at wrong angles, like insects. She could see their heads silhouetted against the indigo sky, noses lifted as if scenting her, jaws opening and closing. North, she shouted. But North did not break his stride. The current claims us all in the end, he called without turning. If you want to live, you have to fight. Alex gave up trying to find the bottom. She wrenched her body toward the east and swam, kicking hard, fighting the current as she plunged her arms into the water. She turned her head to gasp for breath, the weight of her shoes drawing her down, her shoulders aching. Something heavy and muscular bumped her, driving her back, a tail lashed her leg. Maybe the crocodiles couldn't harm her, but they could do the river's work. Fatigue sat leaden in her muscles. She felt her pace slow. The sky had gone dark. She couldn't see the shore any longer, wasn't even sure she was swimming in the right direction. If you want to live. And wasn't that the worst of it? She did. She did want to live, and always had. Hell, she shouted. Goddamn hell. The sky exploded with forked lightning. A little blasphemy to light the way. For a long, horrible moment, there was only black water, and then she spotted the eastern shore. She drove forward, plowing her hands through the water, until at last she let her legs drop. The bottom was there, closer than she thought. She crawled through the shallows, crushing lotus blossoms beneath her sodden body, and slumped down on the sand. She could hear the crocodiles behind her, the low engine rumble of their open mouths. Would they nudge her back to the river's grasp? She dragged herself a few more feet, but she was too heavy. Her body was sinking into the sand, the grains weighing her down, filling her mouth, her nose, drifting beneath her eyelids. Something hard struck Alex's head again, 
then again. She forced her eyes open. She was on her back on the floor of the temple room, choking up mud and staring at Dawes's frightened face framed by the painted sky, mercifully static and free of clouds. Her body was shaking so hard she could hear the thump of her own skull on the stone floor. Dawes seized her, wrapped her up tight, and, slowly, Alex's muscles stopped spasming. Her breathing returned to normal, though she could still taste silt and the bitter remnants of carob in her mouth. You're all right, said Dawes. You're all right. And Alex had to laugh, because the last thing she would ever be was all right. Let's get out of here, she managed. Dawes slung Alex's arm around her shoulders with surprising strength and pulled her to her feet. Alex's clothes were bone dry, but her legs and arms felt wobbly, as if she'd tried to swim a mile. She could still smell the river, and her throat had the raw, fish-slick feel of water going up her nose. Where do I leave the key? asked Dawes. By the door, said Alex. I'll text Salome. That seems so civil. Never mind. Let's break a window and pee on the pool table. Dawes released a breathy giggle. It's okay, Dawes. I didn't die. Much. I went to the borderlands. I made a deal. Oh, Alex. What did you do? What I set out to do. But she wasn't sure how she felt about it. The bridegroom is going to find Tara for us. That's the easiest way to figure out who hurt her. And what does he want? He wants me to clear his name. She hesitated. He claims Darlington was looking into the murder-suicide. Dawes's brows shot up. That doesn't sound right. Darlington hated popular cases like that. He thought they were, ghoulish. Tawdry, said Alex. A faint smile touched Dawes's lips. Exactly. Wait, then the bridegroom didn't kill his fiancé? He says he didn't. That's not quite the same thing. Maybe he was innocent, maybe he wanted to make peace with Daisy, maybe he just wanted to find his way back to the girl he had murdered. It didn't matter. Alex would hold up her end of the bargain. Whether you made a deal with the living or the dead, best not to come up short. 13. Last Fall Darlington had woken from the manuscript party with the worst shame hangover of his life. Alex showed him a copy of the report she'd sent. She'd kept the details murky, and though he wanted to be the kind of person who demanded a strict adherence to the truth, he really wasn't sure he could look Dean Sando in the eye if the specifics of his humiliation were known. He'd showered, made Alex breakfast, then called a car to take them both back to the hutch so he could pick up the Mercedes. He returned to Black Elm in the old car, the images of the previous night a blur in his head. He collected the pumpkins along the drive and put them in the compost pile, raked the leaves from the back lawn. It felt good to work. The house suddenly seemed very empty, in a way it hadn't in a long time. He'd brought few people to Black Elm. When he'd invited Michelle Alamedin to see the place his freshman year, she'd said, This place is crazy. How much do you think it's worth? He hadn't known how to answer. Black Elm was an old dream, its romantic towers raised by a fortune made on the soles of vulcanized rubber boots. The first Daniel Tabor Arlington, Darlington's great-great-great-grandfather, had employed 30,000 people in his New Haven plant. He bought up art and iffy antiquities, purchased a 6,000-square-foot vacation cabin on a New Hampshire lake, given out turkeys at Thanksgiving. The hard times had begun with a series of factory fires and ended with the discovery of a process to successfully waterproof leather. Arlington Rubber boots were sturdy and easy to mass manufacture, but miserably uncomfortable. When Danny was ten, he'd found a heap of them in the Black Elm attic, shoved into a corner as if they'd misbehaved. He dug through until he found a matched pair and used his t-shirt to wipe the dust off them. Years later, when he took his first hit of Hiram's elixir and saw his first gray, 
pale, and leached of color as if still shrouded in the veil, he would remember the look of those boots covered in dust. He'd intended to wear the boots all day, stomping around Black Elm and mucking about in the gardens, but he only lasted an hour before he pulled them off and shoved them back into their pile. They'd given him a keen understanding of why, as soon as people had been offered another option for keeping the wet off their feet, they'd taken it. The boot factory had closed and stood empty for years, like the Smoothie Girdle factory, the Winchester and Remington plants, the Blake brothers and rooster carriages before them. As he grew older, Darlington learned that this was always the way with New Haven. It bled industry but stumbled on, bleary and anemic, through corrupt mayors and daft city planners, through misguided government programs and hopeful but brief infusions of capital. This town, Danny, his grandfather liked to say, a common refrain, sometimes bitter, sometimes fond. This town. Black Elm had been built to look like an English manor house, one of the many affectations adopted by Daniel Tabor Arlington when he made his fortune. But it was only in old age that the house really became convincing, the slow creep of time and ivy accomplishing what money could not. Danny's parents came and went from Black Elm. They sometimes brought presents, but more often they ignored him. He didn't feel unwanted or unloved. His world was his grandfather, the housekeeper Bernadette, and the mysterious gloom of Black Elm. An endless stream of tutors buttressed his public school education, fencing, world languages, boxing, mathematics, piano. You're learning to be a citizen in the world, his grandfather said. Manners, might, and know-how. One will always do the trick. There wasn't much to do at Black Elm besides practice and Danny liked being good at things, not just the praise he received, but the feeling of a new door unlocking and swinging wide. He excelled at each new subject, always with the sense that he was preparing for something, though he didn't know what. His grandfather prided himself on being as much blue-collar as blue blood. He smoked Chesterfield cigarettes, the brand he'd first been given on the factory floor where his own father had insisted he spend his summers, and he ate at the counter at Clark's Luncheonette, where he was known as the old man. He had a taste for both Marty Robbins and what Danny's mother described as the histrionics of Puccini. She called it his man-of-the-people act. There was little warning when Danny's parents came to town. His grandfather would just say, Set the table for four tomorrow, Bernadette. The layabouts are gracing us with their presence. His mother was a professor of Renaissance art. He wasn't entirely sure what his father did micro investing, portfolio building, foreign market hedges. It seemed to change with every visit, and it never seemed to be going well. What Danny did know was that his parents lived off his grandfather's money, and that the need for more of it was the thing that lured them back to New Haven. The only thing, his grandfather would say, and Danny did not quite have the heart to argue. The conversations around the big dinner table were always about selling Black Elm and became more urgent as the neighborhood around the old house began to come back to life. A sculptor from New York had bought up a run-down old home for a dollar, demolished it, and built a vast open space studio for her work. She'd convinced her friends to follow, and Westville had suddenly started to feel fashionable. This is the time to sell, his father would say. When the land is finally worth something. You know what this town is like, his mother said. This town. It won't last. We don't need this much space. It's going to waste, the upkeep alone costs a fortune. Come to New York. We could see you more often. We could get you into a doorman building, or you could move someplace warm. Danny could go to Dalton or board at Exeter. His grandfather would say, private schools turn out pussies. I'm not making that mistake again. Danny's father had gone to Exeter. Sometimes Danny thought his grandfather liked toying with the layabouts. He would examine the scotch in his glass, lean back, prop his feet by the fire if it was winter, contemplate the green cloud formations of the elm trees that loomed over the back garden in the summer. 
he would seem to think on it. He would debate the better places to live, the upside to Westport, the downside to Manhattan. He'd expound on the new condominiums going up by the old brewery, and Danny's parents would follow wherever his fancies led, eagerly, hopefully, trying to build a new rapport with the old fellow. The first night of their visits always ended with I'll think on it, his father's cheeks rosy with liquor, his mother gamely clutching her cocoon of plush cashmere around her shoulders. But by the close of day, too, the layabouts would start to get restless, irritable. They'd push a little harder and his grandfather would start to push back. By the third night, they were arguing, the fire in the grate sparking and smoking when no one remembered to add another log. For a long time Danny wondered why his grandfather kept playing this game. It wasn't until he was much older, when his grandfather was gone, and Danny was alone in the dark towers of Black Elm, that he realized his grandfather had been lonely, that his routine of the diner and collecting rents and reading Kipling might not be enough to fill the dark at the end of the day, that he might miss his foolish son. It was only then, lying on his side in the empty house, surrounded by a nest of books, that Darlington understood how much Black Elm demanded and how little it gave back. The layabout's visits always ended the same way, his parents departing in a flurry of indignation and the scent of his mother's perfume, Karen Poivre. Darlington had learned on a fateful night in Paris the summer after sophomore year, when he'd finally worked up the courage to ask Angelique Brun for a date and arrived at her door to her looking glorious in black satin her pulse points daubed with the expensive stink of his miserable youth. He'd claimed a migraine and cut the evening short. Danny's parents had insisted they would take Danny away, that they'd enroll him in private school, that they'd bring him back to New York with them. At first Danny had been thrilled and panicked by these threats. But soon he'd come to understand they were empty blows aimed at his grandfather. His parents couldn't afford expensive schools without Arlington money, and they didn't want a child interfering with their freedom. Once the layabouts had gone, Danny and his grandfather would go to dinner at Clark's and his grandfather would sit and talk with Tony about his kids and look at family photos and they'd extol the value of good, honest work and then his grandfather would grab Danny's wrist. Listen, he would say, his eyes roomy and wet when you looked this close. Listen they'll try to take the house when I die. They'll try to take it all. You don't let them. You're not going to die, Danny would say. And his grandfather would wink and laugh and reply, not yet. Once, installed in a red booth, the smell of hash browns and steak sauce thick in the air, Danny had dared to ask, why did they even have me? They liked the idea of being parents, his grandfather said waving his hand over the leavings of his dinner. Showing you off to their friends. And then they just dumped me here? I didn't want you raised by nannies. I told them I'd buy them an apartment in New York City if they left you with me. That had seemed okay to Danny at the time, because his grandfather knew best, because his grandfather had worked for a living. And if maybe some part of him wondered if the old man had just wanted another shot at raising a son, had cared more about the Arlington line than what might be best for a lonely little boy, the rest of him knew better than to walk down that dark hall. As Danny got older, he made it a point to be out of the house when the layabouts came to town. He was embarrassed by the idea of hanging around, hoping for a gift or a sign of interest in his life. He'd grown tired of watching them play out the same drama with his grandfather and seeing them indulged. Why don't you leave the old man alone and go back to wasting your time and his money? He sneered at them on his way out of the house. When did the little prince become so pious? His father had retorted. You'll know what it's like when you fall out of favor. But Darlington never had the chance. His grandfather got sick. His doctor told him to stop smoking, change the way he ate, said he could buy himself a few more months, maybe even a year. Danny's grandfather refused. He would have things his way, or not at all. A nurse was hired to live in the house. Daniel Tabor Arlington grew grayer and more frail. The layabouts came to stay, and suddenly Black Elm felt like enemy territory. 
The kitchen was full of his mother's special foods, stacks of plastic containers, little bags of grains and nuts that crowded the counters. His father was constantly pacing through the ground floor rooms, talking on his cell phone, about getting the house assessed, probate law, tax law. Bernadette was banished in favor of a cleaning crew that appeared twice a week in a dark green van and used only organic products. Danny spent most of his time at the museum or in his room with the door locked, lost in books he consumed like a flame-eating air, trying to stay alight. He practiced his Greek, started teaching himself Portuguese. His grandfather's bedroom was crowded with equipment, IVs to keep him hydrated, oxygen to keep him breathing, a hospital bed beside the huge four-poster to keep him elevated. It looked like a time traveler from the future had taken over the dim space. Whenever Danny tried to talk to his grandfather about what his parents were doing, about the real estate agent who had come to walk the property, his grandfather would seize his wrist and glance meaningfully at the nurse. She listens, he hissed. And maybe she did. Darlington was fifteen years old. He didn't know how much of what his grandfather said was true, if the cancer was speaking or the drugs. They're keeping me alive so they can control the estate, Danny. But your lawyer. You think they can't make him promises? Let me die, Danny. They'll bleed black elm dry. Danny went out alone to sit at the counter at Clark's, and when Leona had set a dish of ice cream in front of him, he'd had to press the heels of his hands against his eyes to keep from crying. He'd sat there until they needed to close and only then taken the bus home. The next day, they found his grandfather cold in his bed. He'd slipped into a coma and could not be revived. There were furious, whispered conversations, closed doors, his father yelling at the nurse. Danny had spent his days at the Peabody Museum. The staff didn't mind. There was a whole herd of kids who got dumped there during the summers. He'd walked through the mineral room, communed with the mummy and the giant squid and Crichton's raptor, tried to redraw the reptile mural. He walked the Yale campus, spent hours deciphering the different languages above the Sterling Library doors, was drawn again and again to the Beinecke's collection of tarot cards, to the impenetrable Voynich manuscript. Staring at its pages was like standing at Lighthouse Point all over again, waiting for the world to reveal itself. When it started to get dark, he took the bus home and crept in through the garden doors, moving silently through the house, retreating to his bedroom and his books. Ordinary subjects weren't enough anymore. He was too old to believe in magic, but he needed to believe that there was something more to the world than living and dying. So he called his need and interest in the occult, the arcane, sacred objects. He spent his time hunting down the work of alchemists and spiritualists who had promised ways of looking into the unseen. All he needed was a glimpse, something to sustain him. Danny had been curled up in his high tower room reading Paracelsus, the side weights translation, when his grandfather's attorney had knocked on the door. You're going to have to make some choices, he'd said. I know you want to honor your grandfather's memory, but you should do what's best for you. It wasn't bad advice, but Danny had no idea what might be best for him. His grandfather had lived off the Arlington money, doling it out as he saw fit, but the estate prohibited him from leaving it to anyone but his son. The house was another story. It would be held in trust for Danny until he was eighteen. Danny was surprised when his mother appeared at his bedroom door. The university wants the house, she said, then looked around the circular turret room. If we all sign off, then the profits can be shared. You can come to New York. I don't want to live in New York. You can't begin to imagine the opportunities that will open for you there. Nearly a year before, he'd taken the Metro North to the city, spent hours walking Central Park, sitting in the Temple of Dender at the Met. He'd gone to his parents' apartment building, thought about ringing the bell, lost his nerve. I don't want to leave Black Elm. His mother sat down on the edge of the bed. Only the land is valuable, Danny. 
you have to understand that this house is worthless. Worse than worthless. It will drain every dollar we have. I'm not selling Black Elm. You have no idea what the world is like, Daniel. You're still a child, and I envy that. That's not what you envy. The words emerged low and cold, exactly the way Danny wanted them to sound, but his mother just laughed. What do you think is going to happen here? There's less than $30,000 in the trust for your college education, so unless you think you'd like to make some friends at Yukon, it's time to start reevaluating. Your grandfather sold you a false bill of goods. He led you on just as he led us on. You think you'll be some lord of Black Elm? You don't rule this place. It rules you. Take what you can from it now. This town. Danny stayed in his room. He locked the door. He ate granola bars and drank water from the sink in his bathroom. He supposed it was a kind of morning, but he also just didn't know what to do. There was a stash of $1,000 tucked into a copy of McCullough's 1776 in the library. When he was 18 he'd have access to his college fund. Beyond that, he had nothing. But he couldn't let go of Black Elm, he wouldn't, not so someone could put a wrecking ball through its walls. Not for anything. This was his place. Who would he be untethered from this house? From its wild gardens and gray stone, from the birds that sang in its hedges, from the bare branches of its trees. He'd lost the person who knew him best, who loved him most. What else was there to cling to? And then one day he realized the house had gone silent, that he'd heard his parents' car rumble down the drive, but never heard them return. He opened his door and crept down the stairs to find Black Elm completely empty. It hadn't occurred to him that his parents might simply leave. Had he secretly been holding them hostage, forcing them to stay in New Haven? to pay attention to him for the first time in his life? At first he was elated. He turned on all of the lights, the television in his bedroom and the one in the den downstairs. He ate leftover food from the fridge and fed the white cat that sometimes prowled the grounds at dusk. The next day, he did what he always did, he got up and went to the Peabody. He came home, ate beef jerky, went to bed. He did it again and again. When the school year started, he went to school. He answered all of the mail that came to Black Elm. He lived off Gatorade and chicken rolls from 7-Eleven. He was ashamed that sometimes he missed Bernadette more than he missed his grandfather. One day he came home and flipped the switch in the kitchen, only to discover the electricity had been turned off. He pulled all of the blankets and his grandfather's old fur coat down from the attic and slept buried beneath them. He watched his breath plume in the quiet of the house. For six long weeks he lived in the cold and dark, doing his homework by candlelight, sleeping in the old ski clothes he discovered in a trunk. When Christmas came, his parents appeared at the front door of Black Elm, rosy-cheeked and smiling, laden with presents and bags from Dean and DeLuca, Jaguar idling in the drive. Danny bolted the doors and refused to let them in. They'd made the mistake of teaching him he could survive. Danny worked at the luncheonette. He got a job laying out manure and seed at Edgerton Park. He took tickets at Lyric Hall. He sold off clothes and pieces of furniture from the attic. It was enough to keep him fed and keep the lights on. His few friends were never invited over. He didn't want inquiries about his parents or about what a teenage boy was doing alone in a big, empty house. The answer he couldn't give was simple, he was caring for it. He was keeping Black Elm alive. If he left, the house would die. A year passed, another. Danny got by. But he didn't know how long he could keep just making do. He wasn't sure what came next. He wasn't even sure if he could afford to apply to college with his friends. He would take a year off. He would work, wait for the money from his trust. And then? He didn't know. He didn't know and he was scared, because he was seventeen and already weary. 
He'd never thought of life as long, but now it seemed impossibly so. Later, looking back on what happened, Danny could never be sure what he'd intended that night in early July. He'd been in and out of the Beinecke and the Peabody for weeks, researching elixirs. He'd spent long nights gathering ingredients and sending away for what he couldn't scavenge or steal. Then he'd begun the brew. For thirty-six hours straight he'd worked in the kitchen, dozing when he could, setting his alarm to wake him for the next stage in the recipe. When at last he'd looked down at the thick, tar-like syrup at the bottom of Bernadette's ruined blue cruzet, he'd hesitated. He knew what he was attempting was dangerous. But he'd run out of things to believe in. Magic was all he had left. He was a boy on an adventure, not a boy swallowing poison. The UPS man had found him lying on the steps the next morning, blood streaming from his eyes and mouth. He'd made it out of the kitchen door before he'd collapsed. Danny woke in a hospital bed. A man in a tweed jacket and a striped scarf sat beside his bed. My name is Elliot Sando, he said. I have an offer for you. Magic had almost killed him, but in the end it had saved him. Just like in stories.